I'm just having a laugh, then he said, and wheeled himself closer to the table. I winced, expecting the gun that was almost certainly in his lap to fall from under his knee blanket onto the floor in front of everyone. Just have a coffee, a bagel, something. Read the paper. He shoved a newspaper from the corner of the table at me. Bell, Finney went on, lowering his voice. I got here first. These bozos came in after me. We can't leave now. We'll be submitting. Vinny, this is not a disagreement between dogs about who gets to piss on the best park bench. You're threatening a gunfight in a crowded cafe. Listen to you. So dramatic, he rolled his eyes. The waitress deposited three huge plates of breakfast in front of Driver and his guys. Driver's men seemed to relax slightly as though the appearance of food, rather than the presence of innocent bystanders all around us, meant there wasn't about to be a massacre here in the diner. No one ate. Driver's phone started buzzing again, remaining ignored. You know, I was just reading in the paper there about the little drug crisis we're having in New England, Vinny said as he picked at his collard greens with his fork, his voice rising again for the benefit of Driver and his men. Problem used to be that people were smuggling prescription painkillers into the States from China. Now that the cops have stamped that out, people have started making the pills themselves. <laughs> Can you believe it? One of Driver's guys took up his fork, looking to his boss for permission to eat. Driver was too focused on Vinny and me. The men glanced at each other, undecided as to whether the mere presence of an enemy, even without violence, meant their eggs should get cold. Thing about these pills is, Vinny continued, they're usually made in labs by scientists. But out here, <laughs> you got a bunch of deficientes throwing ingredients together like toddlers in a play kitchen. So the goods can turn out four or five times stronger than they should be sometimes. Driver's guys had broken ranks and started to eat. The two men passed a salt shaker between them. Listen to me, huh? Vinny smiled when nobody responded to his lecture. Trying to school everybody on this stuff. <laughs> I should just shut up and let everybody enjoy their food. He looked over at Driver's table. I followed his gaze. It was then that I noticed that the salt and pepper shakers on Driver's table didn't match. The pepper was round, plain glass with a silver top. The salt was crystal, with a square base, the same kind I had in the dining room of my inn. I looked around the tables, slowly rising out of my seat. The salt shaker on driver's table was the only crystal, square-bottomed shaker in the room. One of driver's guys coughed and grabbed at his throat. Chapter 48 the big guy closest to me gripped his neck and collar like he was choking on a piece of food. His face flushed red, the color spreading downward fast. I had just enough time to lunge forward and grab him as he collapsed sideways out of the bench seat. As I lowered him to the ground, I looked up and saw the other man beside him slump face first into his plate of food, out cold. Cafe diners were out of their seats all around me, chairs scraping, gasps of horror and surprise. As panic thrummed through me, I heard the innocent citizens of Gloucester offering up a gaggle of perfectly ordinary explanations for something I knew had come straight from the realms of impossibility. Oh, God! He's choking! He's having a heart attack! Somebody call 911! Does anyone know CPR? Others were making for the doors, their plates forgotten. Okay, honey, let's go. Grab your toys. Let's give those guys some space. He's fine. He's fine. He's just playing a game. Grab your blankie. Let's go. The man in my arms was convulsing and foaming at the mouth as I dragged him into the aisle and rolled him onto his side. Helplessly, I thumped his back, tried to clear some of the foam from his airway with my fingers. Even from my vantage point, Crouched over the huge construction worker, I could feel the vicious electric tension between Vinny and Driver as the two men were surrounded by helpful strangers. Vinny backed his wheelchair into the next aisle. Driver exited the booth and crouched beside me. 
Get the other guy, I told Driver. Check if he's still breathing. Driver didn't move. He was so close I could feel his breath on the rim of my ear. What are you doing? Get help! I yelled at him. I'm gonna kill everyone in your house, Driver said. He patted my back, two hard thumps, and rose to his feet. As far as the people around us could tell, he probably looked like he was telling me he was going to go flag down a car. The pats, a reassuring gesture. But I knew what they were. They were loaded with the certainty of a man who's as good as his word. Norman Driver was going to kill everyone I cared about. I had his personal guarantee. Chapter 49 Shauna noticed the car following hers as she headed out of a gas station in Ipswich, taking Route 133 back toward Gloucester. She'd spent the rest of the day before lying low thinking and plotting, conserving her energy for what lay ahead. She imagined Henry had been trying to contact her, but she kept her phone off so that her mind was clear and her location couldn't be tracked. Then she'd spent the night in the car near Daniel Boone Park, sleepless, watching the still, flat water through the windshield and thinking about Norman Driver and his crew. The man tailing her was young. He was close enough that Shauna could make him out in the rearview mirror his short, scrubby beard and sunglasses. He held the steering wheel of his truck with one hand and dialed a cell phone over and over with the other, cursing and shaking his head when whoever he was calling didn't answer. When Shauna could see the spire of City Hall in Gloucester, the young man fell back a little, some half-formed instinct reminding him, perhaps, that the best kind of tale didn't involve the threat of running up the back of the mark if she stopped suddenly at a traffic light. Shauna wondered how a man who looked to be in his twenties came to be working for someone as criminally advanced as Norman Driver. Did he see himself reaching boss status when he got to Driver's age, with a crew of underlings dealing drugs or running women or hitting banks or whatever? Or was working for Driver just a temporary gig, the same kind of desperate grab for good money at minimal effort that drove college girls to moonlight as exotic dancers? As Shauna led the young man into Dogtown Commons, the open view of the marshlands yielded to thick winter woods. She took a dirt road past a collapsed farmhouse and pulled over, watching as the young man's truck stopped a hundred or more yards back. Shauna reached down and cranked the heater up. Warm air gushed over her, and soon the windshield was beginning to fog against the icy morning. The vehicle had a good heating system just one of many features she knew cops valued in their vehicles, a desire born of long nights on stakeout. It also had good suspension, sound gas mileage, and plenty of cup holders, all requirements Mark had demanded of their vehicles over the years. Shauna gripped the wheel and watched the mirror, looking for her follower, wondering if the receiver of his frantic calls had finally picked up yet. She unclipped her seatbelt. It was three full minutes later that she heard the faint crunch of his boots on the fallen leaves, perhaps twenty yards behind. Then she heard the shunt of his pistol action only a couple of yards beyond the driver's side door. Shauna heard the gunshots puncture the side of the car and smiled. He'd shot twice into the door, it sounded like, before even opening it. Seemed like he was indeed an ambitious baby criminal, hoping to rise through the ranks. Shauna pushed the trunk lid open and stepped out quietly, taking the shotgun with her. She stood behind the boy, and, while he tore open the driver's side door of the car, she waited for him to put it all together. The empty driver's seat, the flop-down panel in the middle back seat leading through to the trunk, the path through which Shauna had made her escape, another cop feature. Bill would have attended enough road accidents in his career to know how useful an escape route through the trunk could be. The young man with the gun turned around just as Shauna was trying to decide if she should say something powerful, a movie villain's one-liner like, See you in hell. Something that would make it all clear for him how ignorant, selfish, and wasteful he had been to arrive where he was now at the end of his life alone with her in these woods. 
In the end, she said nothing. The boy opened his mouth in shock, taking in the sight of the gun in her hands, and Shauna could see he knew very well how stupid he had been. She shot him in the chest. Desert Outside Bagram, Afghanistan, 2010 Nick allowed himself to be pulled and shoved away from Carly Breacher. Some part of his mind couldn't comprehend that Rick Master had just shot her, that she lay writhing on the ground outside the goat farmer's house while Master tended to the wound he'd just created. Nick was walking in a nightmare, begging himself to wake up, his jaw clenched and step-locked as Roger Dorich pushed him back up the hill. They stood side by side, spraying their own truck with gunfire from the guns they found in the house, and Nick felt blinded by the flashes in the dark. Before he could catch up with his own mind, try to decipher what was happening and what would happen next, he was back at the house, standing alongside Dorich as Master applied field dressings to Breacher's stomach. You shot her! Nick panted, his voice sounding completely foreign to him. Numb. I don't understand what's happening. What are you... We need it to look legit, Dorich said. If we're going to tell them there was a firefight here, it makes sense one of us at least would get tagged. No one's going to question this. She's a colonel's daughter, for Christ's sake. Breacher's eyes were big and wild, her bloody hand gripping Master's shoulder, her eyes on Nick, pleading as she fought to speak through the pain. I'm sorry, Breacher, Master said. It'll all be worth it. I promise, it'll all be worth it. Come on, Dorrit said, and grabbed Nick's shoulder and pushed him toward the house. We have to keep moving. Nick entered the house and walked through the room full of dead family members. His eyes were fixed on his own feet, and yet small clues to the horror intruded into the edges of his vision. A tiny hand flopped open, unmoving. A bare foot, someone lying on their side. Hair splayed over the stained rug. Dorich led Nick into a large room filled with rugs, blankets, pillows. He shoved back a few, searching for something on the ground. All the while, Dorich had one hand pressed against the radio on his helmet. Delta-6 receiving fire at a structure approximately five miles north-northwest of base, requesting immediate assistance. One man down. Over. Finally, Dorich's finger caught on a structure in the bare earth. He lifted a wood panel and flipped it over, then started dragging dusty duffel bags out of a wide hole in the ground. They were faded camo print bags marked with big black block letters, U.S. Army. Nick came when Dorich beckoned him, receiving the bag Dorich tossed him. Hurry up! Grab and go, Jones! Grab and go! Nick bent and opened the bag. Dirty, wrinkled bills, thousands of them, secured in bundles with elastic bands. American dollars. In his dreamy, disassociated state, he reached into the bag and felt the corners and edges of the stacks of cash creep up his arm. A depthless bag of money trying to suck him in by the wrist. Ghost money, he said. Dorich nodded. Nick had heard rumors fluttering around base ever since he arrived about CIA payments to village elders, local non-Taliban warlords, and agents who channeled money all the way to President Hamid Karzai's palace. Six months earlier, outside Tezin, he'd lain on his bunk listening to Dorich reading a New York Times article aloud to his team. The article claimed that Americans were paying cash for safe passage through Taliban red zones. The reporter had described plastic shopping bags, briefcases, duffel bags full of cash being delivered in the dead of night. Army patrols were marking their vehicles with safe codes provided by the elders so that rebels could see them with binoculars and know not to engage. Master had been in a fury as he listened, pacing the room, his fists balled and tucked into his armpits as though to stop himself beating the shit out of someone. I didn't come here to hand American tax dollars over to the goddamn Taliban, he'd raged. I came here to kill those motherfuckers. Dorich was shoving another bag at Nick now, loading two bags onto his own shoulders. How much is here? Nick asked. Should be about four million, Dorich said. 
There's been a bottleneck further up the line. One of the guys who's supposed to bring this money to the higher-ups in Kabul has been skimming off the top, so all the money's pooled here until they can figure out who the thief is. This represents nine months' worth of safe passage payments. Jesus, Nick said. Dorich grinned and slapped his back, thinking, Nick supposed, that he was marveling at the money, at what a million dollars could mean for someone like him, a high school dropout from West Baltimore, with few prospects back home except more deployments to this desert wasteland to fight in a war he didn't half understand. But Nick wasn't marveling at that. He was marveling at the wastefulness of it all, the lives snuffed out in the other room, Breacher and what a gunshot wound at close range to the abdomen would mean for her chances of survival. He marveled at Master and Dorich's apparent complete disregard for the danger this would put Americans into in the coming months. Safe passages, now unsafe again. He marveled at the years he saw stretching outward and away from him in this moment, years in which he would have to keep quiet somehow about what he was doing. Nick could hear choppers on the wind. Let's go, Dorich pulled at him. We gotta stash the bags before they get here. Chapter 50 At sunrise, Nick went to the second-floor bathroom in the Inn by the Sea, stepped up onto the toilet, and popped open the access into the crawl space beneath Nettie Ives' room. Effie was on watch across the hall. He was sure he'd heard Clay Spears' lumbering gait somewhere on the lower floors. If there was anyone else in the house, they seemed to be asleep. Nick reached into the dark and dragged the old duffel bag across a beam to himself, then sat on the edge of the bathtub with it. He could still hear those choppers. He remembered showing members of Bravo 5 through to the room in the goat farmer's house with the empty pit in it. Nothing here when we arrived, just a hole in the ground. Probably drugs, someone guessed. Nick unzipped the duffel bag and looked at the cash. His cut. Just under a million, so he was told. He hadn't spent a single dime. Hadn't unzipped the bag once since he'd retrieved it from an airport locker Dorich had given him the code to a month and a half after he returned from his last tour. It had been Masters' job to retrieve the bags from where they'd been stashed on the night of the massacre not far from the farmhouse in the desert, and get them safely into the U.S., hidden in the engine well of a broken-down troop carrier. Dorich's intel had been sound. Months later, as they sat side by side in a hall at some processing center in Arizona, waiting to describe the massacre to an inquiring committee, Dorich had told Nick about the farmer he and Master had come across while walking by the side of the road to Kabul. He and Master had been on a supply run. They'd stopped and talked to the guy because they were bored. Dorich told Nick about the nervous chit-chat the man had engaged in with them, the suggestion that ghost money was being funneled through a nearby valley. It had taken months of research, Dorich said, months of lies, secret rendezvous outside the base, bribes to farmers, roadmen, bandits, sorting the rumors from the lies from the cover stories. Dorich said he had wanted to bring Nick and Breacher in on the plan from the beginning, but it was Master who didn't trust them to go through with it. Nick was a soft touch, and convincing Breacher to risk her body like that would have been a hard sell. Easier to beg for forgiveness than to ask for permission, Dorich theorized, and a million dollars bought a whole lot of forgiveness. Nick zipped up the bag and took out his phone. His thumb hovered over the green dial button below the name of his latest therapist. He put the phone down, bit his fist to try to stop the tears. He googled the tip line for the New York Times, tapped through to the blue highlighted phone numbers, and again let his thumb tremble over the screen without dialing, playing the tape through to the end in his mind and trying to find something positive to latch onto. But there was only darkness ahead. And shame. Terrible, terrible shame. He swiped the search page away and opened the phone's camera, turned it on himself. The phone gave a little musical sigh as he began recording. My name is Nick Jones, he said. I'm a specialist E-4 veteran with the United States Army. I have something to report.
Chapter 51 Driver stood over the dead kid in the forest and felt old. Maybe it was the vision of the young construction worker lying twisted in the leaves, the gaping hole in his chest, and his surprised expression that was making Driver feel the years he had under his belt that this kid would never have. Maybe it was the adrenaline draining from his system after a night spent madly organizing the stealthy shutdown and evacuation of four of his drug labs, a stash house, and a distribution center from inside properties being stripped and reclad. Moving a drug lab was a lot of work. He couldn't risk just having his guys load up the packages and drive them off. Not now, while the heat was on. He'd had to arrange for other members of his crew to get into road accidents, pub brawls, violent domestic arguments to tie up the local cops and sheriffs, keep the roads clear of curious patrols. Then there was the decision he had to make about where to stash his operation until this Shauna Bolger woman could be found. Driver had just been thinking he'd get a good breakfast in and catch a 20-minute nap in his truck when the gimp in the wheelchair and the washed-up ex-cop had killed two of his men and ruined his morning. Now this. Driver's head hurt and his bones ached. Maynard and Dollar, his guys from the dock, were standing nearby awaiting orders, cigarettes cupped in their palms against the wind. I don't even know this kid's name, Driver said. Spitz, Maynard said. He gestured to the corpse with his cigarette. Reggie Spitz's brother. Reggie started him a couple of weeks ago, just watching over a couple of corner boys over in Georgetown. Must have come over when he heard you was looking for the Bulger woman. Well, Driver sighed, pulling out his own cigarette. He found her. Driver's phone dinged. He looked at the screen, which was still full of unanswered call notifications. Driver vaguely remembered the phone going off while his men collapsed from the drugs in their salt shaker. He opened the message. It was from a guy manning one of his houses in West Gloucester. Five O, the message read. Cops had arrived. Driver sent a thumbs up. Let the sheriff search the house. Sheriff Clay Spears was a resident of the inn where Bill Robinson lived. Driver imagined the sheriff would be hitting all of his properties that day, looking for drugs or paraphernalia. News would filter soon enough to the residents who had hired Driver's crews to reclad their houses. If Driver thought his phone was blowing up now, he dreaded the calls that were to come from concerned citizens hearing rumors that their homes were being used for criminal activity. This Bulger woman, Driver said, is the biggest pain in my ass I've had in decades. The men nearby listened, nodding wanting to smirk but unsure if it was safe to. Driver bent and searched the Spitzboy's pockets for his belongings. He found a wallet in his back pocket, but nothing else. A footstep in the woods behind them made all three men turn. Driver didn't pull his gun. He didn't need to. Both his men had the woman in the sights of their pistols far quicker than he ever could. He didn't recognize the good-looking Hispanic woman approaching with her hands up, palms out but the buzz cut and the fact that she'd managed to get within ten feet of them without being heard said to Driver she was either military or a cop. I come in peace, she called out, offering a pained smile. Who the hell are you? Driver asked. I'm a friend, Carly Breacher said. I want something from inside the inn, just as badly as you do. Chapter 52 Clay Spears seemed filled with foreboding even before I'd explained my and Susan's plan to lure Shauna Bulger into the boathouse on the bay. The sheriff leaned against a pillar by a red kayak with his huge arms folded, watching me skeptically, trying to find an out. Susan perched on a workbench near him, chewing her nails. The silence while Clay contemplated our proposition was punctuated by small waves that whispered through the creaking boards at our feet. It was a beautiful night out there in Gloucester, the water calm and black, and the stars peppering the wide skies. Susan and I had called Clay, and we'd all arrived at the marina almost simultaneously, slipped into the boathouse silently to talk about our plan. Clay had heard what we wanted to do. He did not look enthused. 
You know, Clay said, I'm busy. It took me just about all day to track down the phone number you wanted. He sighed and looked through the windows at the setting sun. I was managing my team and some guys I borrowed from Ipswich, searching all of Driver's properties one by one. And here I am, at the same time, asking every scumbag in a Driver construction uniform that I come across what phone number they were using to contact Maris. We're really grateful, Clay, Susan said. Maris was a sometime prostitute, Clay went on, a drug cook's girlfriend. She was also a known thief, in and out of jail all the time for hawking stolen goods. You know how many phone numbers she's had in the last month? At least five, all burners, all untraceable. You're a saint, Clayton Spears, I nodded. Now that I finally have the number, Clay said, I know that, according to you guys, is probably the phone number that Shauna Bolger is using to contact Norman Driver. It makes sense, Susan said. We're guessing Shauna would have found the phone on Maris's body. It would have had Driver's number in it. So, what I don't get, Clay said, is why I shouldn't just put a trace on the number and locate Shauna Bolger myself. Because our plan is better, I said. It's safer. It's safer, Clay squinted. Yes, I pleaded. Look, if you track Shauna down and try to approach her with a bunch of sheriffs, she might fire on you. She's really unpredictable right now. She's hell-bent on killing Norman Driver. If you find her or a member of the public spots her and calls it in, someone could get hurt in a shootout or God knows what else. The best thing we can do right now is take care of this ourselves, Clay, quietly and carefully. Clay looked at Susan, tapping one stubby finger on his biceps, his scowl heavy. We don't have a lot of time for you to ponder this, Clay, Susan said gently. If Driver gets to Shauna first, we're in big trouble. We don't know if he had contacts within the police who would do the exact same thing for him, track the phone to find her. And if Shauna dumps Maris's phone, our whole plan falls in a heap. We need to do this now, right now. Clay looked at me, his scowl collapsing into a defeated pout. Why do I have to hit you? He asked me. Why can't Susan do it? Because she's my girlfriend, buddy, I said, smiling despite myself. It's harder for her. You sure? Clay asked. I've heard you two argue over who folds the laundry. Susan and I laughed. Clay took the zip ties off the workbench by Susan and heaved a huge sigh. Chapter 53 Shauna stopped the car at the side of the road and turned the engine off. The gently descending evening sun only touched the outer trees of the woods on Norman Driver's property. Beyond them, Shauna could see only blackness. While the front of Driver's land, with the long driveway and the towering oak trees, was clear, the back half seemed dense. She wondered if there were bodies buried here. Shauna couldn't see Norman Driver bringing the victims of his drug trade to his own home for disposal. Those nosy cops, dutiful citizens, or junkies about to flip that presented him with problems. But, knowing what he had done to Georgette Winter Lee, perhaps there were other kinds of bodies here. Gloucester had only been Driver's home for a year or so. Had the same urge that had driven him to attack Georgette taken hold of him here? Or was she his only ghost? Shauna didn't know. She planned to find out. The rifle lay on the seat beside her, the shotgun in the trunk, where she had placed it after killing the boy in the woods. She supposed she would need both, having only vague plans about what she would do when she got to Driver's home. If he was away, she'd lie and wait for him. If he was there, she hoped to prolong whatever scenario unfolded. Make him sorry. Make him confess things humiliate him again and enjoy herself. She turned and reached into the back of the car, tested the lid of the box that contained the evidence that had the potential to bury Driver. It was shut tight. She had popped open the driver's side door with two bullet holes in it and was about to step out when Maris's phone buzzed in the glove compartment. Shauna slid back into the car. On the screen, a photograph. It was of her friend, Bill Robinson, 
He was lying slumped against the wall of an old wood-paneled room. His lip was split, blood running in a steady stream from his mouth onto the chest of his white shirt. Shauna saw that his wrists were bound in front of him with thin black plastic zip ties. A text message followed the photograph. Twenty minutes, or I put a bullet in his head. The number wasn't the one she knew to be driver's, but she figured the text had to be from him. Shauna exhaled, heard the shuddering of her frightened breath. Another message came, this one with a pin dropped at the center of a map. She tapped the pin, and the map spun out, revealing a blue, glowing path. She had a decision to make now. Follow directions into what was almost certainly an ambush and try to save her friend. Or lie here and wait for driver and sacrifice Bill. Shauna put the phone down on the dashboard and pressed her head against the steering wheel. The old Shauna, the woman she had been until two days ago, when two intruders came into her house and put a gun in her face, would have rushed to Bill's aid, no matter the consequences. But she was a new person now, someone who got revenge, someone who ran from capture, someone who had killed coldly and deliberately. What did friendship mean to this new woman? She put a hand on the key in the ignition, but didn't turn it. Chapter 54 Nick sat across the living room from Vinny at the inn. He'd known guys in the service who looked the way Vinny looked now. The old gangster was gesticulating with his battered hands, his speech steadily growing faster as he described the scene at the diner. Vinny's eyes were distant, relishing, reliving. Nick had played attentive audience to dozens of men like Vinny in his time. Proud killers. He was glad that Angelica and the woman guest with the kid had all moved to a motel in town to get away from the trouble at the inn. The way Vinny was talking would give normal people nightmares. So I'm trying not to look. Vinny was saying, his smile so wide Nick could see his blackened molars. But I'm watching the plates, and I'm hoping these guys are the kind of rednecks who just add salt to everything, you know, without even tasting. And what do you know? Soon as the plate hits the table, bam! I got the one guy. He's loading up his plate. Shika, shika, shika. Vinny made a shaking motion with an imaginary salt shaker. Nick rested his chin on his knuckles on the arm of his chair. And it's like I said, Vinny shrugged. I don't know how strong the stuff is. I bought it for way too much from a pair of truckers, and they couldn't tell me. Every time they take this stuff, they said, it's a roll of the dice. Trial and error. Life and death. Kind of exciting, huh? And I mean, that's the whole point, right? Nobody knows what they're buying or what they're dealing so I'm thinking, these guys are either going to shrivel up like a pair of slugs, or they're going to get a little giggly like teenagers on mushrooms. Who knows? How long did it take them to die? Nick asked, his tone even. The guy in the booth? Oh, <laughs> he went out like a light, said Vinny, snapping his fingers. But the one guy who Bill caught before he hit the floor, I don't know. I didn't stick around. When I left, Bill was trying out CPR. Man, drive his face when the guy across from him started coughing. Vinny laughed, pretended to choke, grabbing at his throat and rolling his eyes up in his head. Nick didn't move, didn't smile. The older man hadn't seemed to notice that he was the only person enjoying this conversation. Nick wasn't having fun, but he wasn't angry. He felt numb looking out at the darkness beyond the French doors. He wondered how long it had been since he'd become the kind of person who could sit listening to a man laugh about murders he had committed that day, like he was reciting a beloved family anecdote. It felt like a lifetime. Nick couldn't find the lines that divided just and evil actions anymore, good and bad deaths, times to be silent and times to speak. So he just listened. He looked at his phone on the coffee table before him, thought about the recording it contained. He'd just put into words memories that he'd kept inside since 2010. And as he'd voiced them aloud, 
he'd experienced the same unquestioning paralysis, like he'd already felt all that he could possibly feel about what happened in Afghanistan, and now he was hollowed out. Nick heard Effie's footsteps on the stairs, and then she was in the doorway, pointing frantically toward the hall and the little foyer beyond it. He went there and recognized Breacher's silhouette beyond the stained glass panels in the door. He opened it, feeling Effie crowding at his back, the enormous rifle in her arms pointed at the ceiling. Nick looked Breacher over, gave Effie the nod that it was okay. You gotta go, Nick said. He held a hand up before Breacher could speak. It's not safe here. We've got all kinds of trouble headed this way from Bill's end of things, and it's just not a good time. I'm sorry, Nick, Breacher said. For a moment, Nick thought she must have meant about the timing. Some part of him assumed she was about to suggest they meet again in the daylight hours, when the unease that comes with night had lifted, and she could try to convince him that she wasn't lying to him. But another, deeper part of him was unsurprised as he heard glass breaking at the back of the house. Effie's sneakers squeaked on the floor behind him as she swiveled, desperately trying to decide if she should respond to the intruders at the back or stay with the intruder at the front. Nick looked down at the pistol Breacher drew from her jacket pocket. She leveled it at his chest. Chapter 55 they backed up. From where he stood at the junction of the foyer and the dining room doorway, Nick saw what had to be Norman Driver and two of his men enter through the kitchen, glass crunching on their boots, the hard-headed construction boss at the lead with a pistol in his grip. Effie leveled the rifle at the approaching trio, but Nick put a hand on top of it, halting her. There was no telling whether Effie had calculated the odds of their situation or not. Maybe she had and she was willing for them both to be blown apart rather than submit to Breacher, Driver, and the two crewmen. She was younger, hot-headed, and trigger-happy. Nick took the rifle from Effie's hands and leaned it against the umbrella stand. He was silent and calm, hands on Effie's shoulders, as Breacher flicked her gun and motioned for them to follow Driver and his guys into the sitting room. Vinny was motionless in his wheelchair, only his white-knuckled grip on the armrests, indicating he felt anything more than he would watching another visitor to the house enter the room. Driver's men drew the blinds. Breacher pushed Nick and Effie into the corner of the room while Driver leveled his pistol at Vinny's head. You got any more talking to do, old man? Driver asked the ancient gangster in the chair. Yeah, sure, Vinny smiled. I want to tell you this. It's going to be busy down there in hell. You might think you'll slip by me in the crowd, but you won't. I'm going to be there, holding the door open for you. Driver smiled. Vinny grinned back. I know I won't be waiting long, Vinny said. Nick and Effie gripped each other as Driver fired. Vinny's head bucked, and he sagged dead in his chair. Chapter 56 Nick didn't know if his knees gave out and he sank onto the couch beside Effie or if Breacher pushed him down. The room seemed to be turning slowly, ticking back on itself like the hands of a broken clock. Effie's hand gripped his own, trenched in sweat. On the coffee table near where he had been sitting earlier, his phone began buzzing, probably Bill. The silence in the room and the smell of the gunshot pulled him out of himself, away from the screaming of his mind at Vinny lying dead in his chair. Driver turned the gun on Nick as his two men left the room, heading for the stairs. The weirdo in the room upstairs, Driver said. We're going to bring him down. That leaves Bulger, Robinson, the girlfriend, and the bitch who talks too much. Where are they? I don't know, Nick said carefully. He lifted his eyes to Breacher. Bill and Susan have been out looking for Shauna Bulger. She was never in this with us. She borrowed Bill's car, that's all. Save it, Driver snapped. Angelica got a room at a motel in town, Nick continued, the words feeling like razor blades in his throat. She didn't feel safe here. 
What about guests? Preacher said. You mentioned there was a mother and child, overnighters. Nick shrugged. Clay moved them. He's, he's got a thing with the mother, a romantic thing. Breacher and Driver looked at each other. There were footsteps on the stairs, and Driver's two men shoved Nettie Ives into the room. The tall, hollow-eyed man folded himself carefully into a little armchair across the room from where Nick and Effie sat. Driver smiled at Nettie Ives. He nudged the man beside him, gesturing to Nettie with his pistol. This is the joker with the hand grenade, Driver said. He cocked his head, took Nettie Ives in. I bet you felt real powerful, didn't you? Making me walk all the way to my truck, holding it just so as you'd give me the pin back. I bet you thought you'd make a real pussy out of me. Nettie Ives said nothing. Driver lifted his gun. Who's the pussy now? He asked. He fired. Nettie Ives collapsed and fell off his chair. Effie tried to leap off the couch to throw herself at Driver. Nick had to wrap his arms around her middle to contain her, gritting his teeth as she twisted and dragged her heels down his shins. Don't be stupid, Effie. Don't be stupid, Nick cried. Yeah, same goes for you, Breacher said, and turned to Driver, gesturing to the lanky man writhing in pain on the floor in front of his armchair. Don't be stupid. You keep going and you're going to kill everyone in the goddamn house and leave us with no leverage at all. We need two things, your box and my money, and it's going to take some bargaining to achieve that. So start bargaining, Driver said, turning to Nick. In his eyes, Nick could see the mechanical turnings of a soldier's mind as they moved through battle, calculating, assessing, emotionlessly weighing one move against the next. He knew there was no compassion there, no room for subtleties, nuance. Nick knew that if he didn't respond correctly now, he was going to die. There was plenty of leverage left in Effie and Nettie Ives. Start with the box, Driver said. Shauna Bulger must have stashed it here. I know she did. It would have been the safest option for her. So, where is it? I, I don't know, Nick insisted. You can trust me on that. I don't know. And you'd be wasting precious time trying to hurt me or my friends to get me to say anything else. Driver clicked his teeth hard. He tightened his grip on the gun in his hand and glanced off toward the other rooms, the dark and silent hall, and the yawning corridors upstairs. He seemed to decide, as Nick hoped he would, that he was wasting time here, that now he'd made entry into the house, the most efficient use of his time would be to search for what he wanted, find it, and leave before their window of access was closed by police arriving or residents returning home. Driver nodded at Breacher, and he and his men left. After a few seconds, Nick heard drawers being ripped open in the dining room, shelves and cabinets smashing to the ground. The windows of the old house shook as furniture was overturned and shoved against walls. All the while, Breacher watched him. Where's the money, Nick? Breacher asked. Come on, Nick sighed. Don't you think Driver's just going to pop you and take the money as soon as you find it? And what makes you so sure I didn't spend my entire share? Because it's you. Breacher shook her head. She seemed suddenly miserably tired. You're the bleeding heart. The moral goddamn compass. That's the whole reason Dorich and Master didn't let you in on the plan in the desert, because you'd never have gone along with it. I'll be shocked if you spent a single dollar of that money in all these years, Nick. You're right, he nodded. I haven't. It's all still there. Where? Breacher almost spat the word at him. Tell me where, so we can end this. He remained silent. Nick could feel Effie staring at him, trying to put his story all together. On the floor, Nettie Ives was gripping the carpet with one hand, trying to breathe through the pain. Where is it? Breacher demanded again. He just stared at her, and she must have seen something in his eyes that made her crumble. She turned away, and that was risky. Nick felt Effie's whole body tense, ready to leap at the other woman. But he held her back, shook his head. Their time would come. 
He could hear drawers of utensils smashing down on the kitchen tiles. Breacher seemed angry at herself for letting her emotions get the better of her, for letting her mechanical mind wander. Nick knew it was time to learn the truth. You knew, didn't you, he said, about their plan. Breacher nodded. I overheard them talking at the base, she said, Dorich and Master. Breacher drew a long breath, let it out slow. I came back from Chow unexpectedly, and I heard them running through the steps. Divert off a routine patrol, hit the house, kill the family, shoot up the vehicles. She shook her head, bitter. What I overheard must have been an early version. They must have come up with a plan B later on because what happened in the desert that night wasn't what they said they were going to do. So what was the original plan? Nick asked. They were going to kill you, Preacher said. Nick swallowed hard, trying to keep his mind in order. He couldn't react to this news now, couldn't let it carry him away into the blessed rage that was waiting to envelop him. And you... were okay with that? Nick's voice broke as he tried to get the words out. I was okay with that, Preacher said, her gaze locked on his. I could see their way of thinking. You dying out there would make the massacre look legit, and it would mean we'd each get a third of the money, not a quarter, and it would have made my own plan easier overall. Your own plan, Nick said. I planned to take Dorich and Master out as soon as they'd finished with you. That's why I didn't tell them that I knew what was going to happen. I was going to be the sole survivor, Carly Breacher said. Winner takes all. Chapter 57 Shauna stopped the car on a quiet curve of road north of the marina, stepped out into the long grass, and watched the cold lights, the stillness. Shauna saw no police cruisers, no construction vehicles, the place was lit up like a shopping mall. Boat lights, road lights, markers on the pier, and lamps overhanging the closed office, all blazing yellow and icy white into the evening. Something told Shauna that the situation was wrong, but she had no choice now. Bill needed her. He was the one strand connecting her to the earth, a string stopping her from being swept away into dark winds. Because she had known she supposed, that there would be other Norman drivers in her future, that Pooney and Maris were the beginning, and the boy in the forest was a continuation, and Driver was going to be her next in an infinite line of nexts. Only Bill Robinson and the photograph of him lying beaten and bound had managed to ground her. She took the rifle from the car, locked the vehicle, and began to walk. She took a shortcut off the access road and crouched in the bushes, her knees popping, watching for movement. Waves of exhaustion swept over her the last couple of days, like a cross-country journey awakening muscles she hadn't used in years, angering worn-down joints and disturbing her equilibrium. She told herself to push on. There was plenty of motion up there, boats bobbling, flags and sails being caressed by the breeze. By the time Shauna crept down the embankment and halfway along the little beach beside the marina in the blackness, her eyes were watering from the brightness of the lights. It only occurred to her that this had been the plan all along when she heard the hammer of a revolver click back right beside her ear. She turned, the rifle frozen in her hands, but saw only explosions of green and red light as her vision tried to recover from the lights of the marina. Put it down, a voice said. Shauna lowered her rifle to the cold, damp sand. The cloudy color in her eyes dissolved, revealing a huge, hulking man in a sheriff's uniform. She might have felt some wave of dread or shame as the big guy drew her tiny wrists behind her back and cuffed her for the first time in her life, but there was no time. She was struck instead with a gut punch of betrayal as Bill Robinson and the girlfriend Susan emerged from the shadows, too. Wow, Shauna said and shook her head. She had to smile at the cleverness of it all. She looked at the split in Bill's lip. So who bopped you then? Clay did, 
Bill gestured to the sheriff, very reluctantly. Well, I wish he'd left a piece for me, Shauna spat on the ground. You're a betrayer, Bill, a Judas. I'm sorry, Shauna, Bill said. You know, this is not the way it's supposed to end, Shauna said. Her throat was tightening with rage and regret. All you had to do was look the other way for one more night. But I guess taking the law into your own hands is a privilege that's reserved just for you, huh? Let's just cool it, everybody, okay? Clay's deep voice, full of authority, quieted them all. You guys want to be nasty to each other. You can do it on your own time. I just punched a friend, and now I'm arresting a lady, and neither of those things are my idea of a good time. I don't need to hear you sniping at each other as well. Shauna gazed at Bill, shivering with fury. So, where's the box? the sheriff asked. Mrs. Bulger, you're going to make my life easy and just tell me? Or are we going to do a dance back at the station for a while first? It's in the car, Shauna said. Bill's car. I parked just around the bend there. Right, the sheriff said, nodding toward Bill and Susan. Well, bad news, Bill. I'm going to have to confiscate the whole car. It's been used by Mrs. Bulger for a couple of days now in the commission of several crimes. I can't... I get it. Bill held a hand up. Don't worry. I get it. Come on, Mrs. Bulger. The sheriff moved her, pushing her sideways, his big hand gentle yet inescapable, an iron clamp locked around her biceps. Shauna went with him, and they walked into the darkness away from the marina. She spied the cruiser ahead, backed into a gap between dense bushes off the side of the road. Her footprints in the sand below her led nowhere, disappearing as he guided her up a set of concrete steps and onto the road. Now the humiliation was coming on heavier and heavier, like a series of blankets heaped onto her body. Her legs felt wobbly. She imagined the next few hours sitting in a cell and then the inevitable meeting with a lawyer. The decision on whether to plead temporary insanity or some form of cognitive decline brought on by aging. She'd be in diapers in a locked ward within a month, even faster than Henry had planned. The sheriff guided her toward the cruiser. Shauna looked up at the barely visible stars, then at him. The big man was walking beside her now, her arm in one hand, the rifle in the other. He had a kindly face. She'd seen regret flash there as Bill mentioned the punch to the mouth, the real and genuine squeamishness of a man who didn't like violence of any sort. An old-fashioned, warm-hearted man who tended to think and expect the best of people. A man who put on the uniform every day because he was full of goodness and was bubbling up and over the rim of the saucepan and he just didn't know what to do with it all. This was a man who could be deceived, Shauna thought. Chapter 58 On the beach, Susan drew me back to myself, watching with guilt as Clay led Shauna away in cuffs. She ran a hand through my hair, and I was sucked back into this moment. Despite the pain and exhaustion, there was an almost romantic lifting in my heart. The marina bathed us in a yellow glow, and the wind was tousling Susan's hair, and I told myself that no matter what had happened in the days before or what was coming, I had this moment. I had done my duty, and though angry and damaged, I knew Shauna would be locked up safe. My girlfriend kissed her fingertip and pressed it gently to my busted lip. Poor baby, she smiled. Baby? Are you kidding? I snorted. I took that punch like a man. It must have been hot as hell to watch. I don't know how you contained yourself. It was, she thought, then conceded. It was a strangely evocative display. I'll struggle to contain myself at least until we get home. I took out my phone and looked at the screen. When I saw that Nick had not returned my call, a knot of fear bawled in my chest. I tried to call him almost an hour earlier, and he hadn't answered. While I'd waited for Shauna to come to the marina, my phone had been on silent. I dialed again, stood listening to the tone, then gave up figuring he was catching some downtime before his first watch of the house. 
Let's go, I said, and wrapped an arm around Susan. All I want to do is catch a couple hours of shut-eye before I go on watch. Chapter 59 Carly Breacher's eyes blazed. Nick looked at his former teammate, friend, and lover, and felt cold inside, like the last embers of a fire were being unceremoniously stomped out. Breacher's grip was firm on the pistol, steady and tight. A single droplet of sweat would have given him hope, a tendon straining, but it was that dry, controlled grip on the gun that told him everything he needed to know, even before she spoke. I was okay with you dying in the desert, she said, and I'm okay with it now. I believe you, Nick said. I'm broke, Breacher continued. She took a moment to look at Vinny, dead in the chair, Nettie writhing on the floor, Effie tucked into Nick's side. I blew through my share of the money years ago. You know how it goes. I'd never had real money before, so I handed some out to family and friends, spent some having a good time, tried to chase my losses with bad investments. The rest? Trizzled away. So I got desperate. I figured I'd hit Dorage first because he was going to be the biggest challenge. I needed to be fresh, ready for anything. But I spooked him on the approach. He left that message for me that he was being tailed. He knew someone was after him. He hid the money. When I finally came for him, he wouldn't give it up. He was always so hard, Nick smiled sadly. Never said a word, Breacher shook her head, hardly listening. Even when I backed him into the tub, even when it was clear this was the end, tell me or die. Nick watched her shake the regret off like it was dust on her shoulders. So now I'm even more desperate, Breacher said, composed again. You understand? I do, Nick said. But you don't need to think about the money right now. What? Breacher squinted at him. You've got bigger problems, Nick said. Finally, that bead of sweat. Just one, at her hairline. She swiped it away. Nick relished in delicious, tenuous hope. He heard something thump in a room upstairs, a mattress being flipped off a bed frame, maybe, or a dresser being shoved over. The phone on the coffee table, he pointed. Pick it up. Breacher didn't move. You need two things, Nick said. First, you need me to give you a code to unlock the phone. Then you need me to give you the password to my Twitter account. Why the fuck do I need to get into your Twitter? Breacher's mouth fell open. She blinked at him, more sweat beating now on the smooth skin over her left collarbone. Nick didn't need to explain it, but he did anyway. I made a confession video, he said. I tagged all the right people. It's scheduled to go live on the internet at seven o'clock. Breacher's head whipped around, looking for a clock. She stepped back and almost fell over the coffee table. She caught sight of the black marble clock on the mantelpiece that read 6.25 p.m. You! She picked up his phone, shook it in her hand as though to weigh it, to measure if the device itself was real. No. This is bullshit. You couldn't have known we were coming here tonight. You wouldn't have set this up. You wouldn't have stayed in the house. Are you going to bank on that? Nick asked. Breacher's chest heaved with panicked breath. Nick winced as she raised the pistol and pointed it at Effie. The code, Breacher said. Now, or I'll start putting holes in her. No, Nick said. He looked at Effie, expecting her features to be taut with horror and betrayal. He was surprised by the smile he saw there. But he supposed Effie was calculating, as Breacher was calculating, the many exit routes now closed to the woman holding the gun on them. Because she couldn't kill Effie and Nettie Ives now, or Nick wouldn't give her the codes. She couldn't flee, because leaving Nick and his friends to driver's men would be the same as killing them. And in 35 minutes, her world would be destroyed no matter how far she ran. When Breacher spoke, her teeth flashed brightly between her lips. She sneered the single word with so much malice, Nick winced. Go, she said to Effie. Effie didn't wait. She dashed to Nettie's side, swung the tall man's arm around her shoulders, and helped him up. They limped out the door. 
Nick uttered six numbers, his whole body alive with exhilaration as he heard Effie slip out the rear kitchen door to safety. Breacher's eyes were downcast to the phone screen, her gun still trained on Nick's face. You logged out of Twitter, she said. I did. So give me the password, she said. No, Nick said. I let them go, Breacher said. She was panting hard, and Nick could see the little girl in her for the first time. The child who had grown up under a star-spangled military father. The one who was an adult now, fearing the disgrace that would follow. The discharge. The prison time. The disownment. Give. Me. The. Password. The moment I do that, you'll call those men back in here, Nick said, glancing toward the door. And I'm as good as dead. You need to walk me out of this house alive. Then I'll... He had no time to finish. Breacher walked off, disappearing through the foyer to the dining room. He should have run, but, drawn by curiosity or simply by fear, he followed her instead. Driver's two men were in the room, one ripping books off a shelf in the back living area, the other crouched and poring over a pile of debris under a window. Nick could hear footsteps on the old boards overhead. It sounded like Driver was upstairs. In three seconds, maybe less, Breacher had walked into the room and shot both of Driver's men in the head, one in the back of the skull, the other in the temple as he turned toward the noise. Before Nick could react, bodily or emotionally, Breacher was with him again, the gun in his ribs as she shoved him toward the front door of the house. Go, she said again. Chapter 60 Clayton Spears wondered quietly if the little old woman he'd just put in the back of his cruiser was the oldest person he'd ever had back there. There wasn't much crime after a person hit 70, either because they were dead, too dumb to stay out of jail, or too smart not to go legit by then. Sure, he'd had people of a certain vintage in the vehicle. Only a month earlier, he'd been cruising around town on a hellishly rainy day and had spotted an older man getting drowned on his way back from the supermarket. He'd given him a ride, but in the front passenger seat. The back was for the perps. He watched Shauna Bolger in the rearview mirror as he radioed in for updates. She seemed to be panting softly like an exhausted bird. He assumed this was her first ever arrest. Guilt clawed at his insides. Sheriff Spears, back on the line, he sighed into the radio. Dispatch, what's the lay of the land, over? It's really kicking off here tonight, Sheriff, the radio crackled. Boss, we got a possible drag race in Dogtown, minor assault in a hotel on Washington Street, couple of reports of prowlers over the North District. I'll be right in, Clay said. He tossed the mic back at the receiver. Okay, Mrs. Bolger, I'm going to need you to get your mind around what's going to happen over the next few hours. Seems like we've got some dramas in town. The last couple of days have been madness all over Gloucester. He started the engine and pulled out, taking the curved road around the marina toward where she had said she'd parked Bill's car. We're going to get this box of evidence you've been toting around, and then I'm going to have to drop you and it at the station, Clay said. He straightened in his seat, making the leather groan unflatteringly. I would have liked to come in and process you, get you into a nice comfy holding cell of your own, maybe see if I could rustle up a cup of tea. But it's not that kind of night, ma'am, so you'll be stuck in the bullpen, I'm afraid, with the riffraff. Only a cough sounded from the back seat in response. He glanced in the mirror. Shauna Bolger was red-faced, still panting. Are you feeling all right? Clay asked. Have you <clears throat> got any water up there? She rasped. Clay started to get a sinking feeling in his belly. Uh, sure. Yeah, let me... He spotted Bill's car up ahead. Let me just pull over here. By the time Clay had pulled over and slipped out of the driver's seat, Mrs. Bolger was on her side, curled up on the faded leather bench seat like she'd been sucker-punched. Her rattling coughing filled the car as he tore open the door. Oh, man, Clay said, and lifted her out of the car like a doll and set her on the roadside. Oh, Jesus, what's going on? 
My chest hurts. <sighs> she sucked in shallow sips of air. Clay had the cuffs off her wrists faster than he'd ever released a suspect in his life. The guilt was now thumping in his eardrums like a sonic beat. He was bending over her tiny body, trying to roll her into the recovery position, when Mrs. Bulger's arm whipped around, her hand mashing a palmful of dirt into his wide, concerned eyes. Clay grabbed at his face his yelp of surprise morphing into a yelp of pain as he felt her drive her knee into his crotch. Clay hit the gravel at the side of the road like a bag of bricks. He gripped her ankle briefly as Shauna Bulger slipped away. He was only just clearing the dirt from his eyes when he was blinded again by the dust her tires threw up as she sped off in Bill's car. Chapter 61 I recognized the distinct headlights of Effie's Mustang zooming through the night as we drove back toward the inn in Susan's car. Susan must have seen her, too, because she swiveled fast in her seat as I did, catching a mere glimpse of our friend in the other car. My heart lurched as my phone buzzed in my pocket. I pulled it out and read the message, every typed letter sending zings of terror over my skin. BGX4 at I-N-N-W-N. When I looked up, Susan's eyes were full of dread. Bad guys at the inn with Nick, I deciphered. Four of them. I didn't have to tell Susan not to approach the house in the car. My hands were trembling as I got out. Susan's breath in the night air was misting gold under one of few street lamps lining the woods. We call Clay, Susan said. We call in everyone we can. I can try, I said. I dialed and started walking. Susan was right by my side, unquestioning of my decision to head toward the inn on foot without waiting for backup. We couldn't rely on help coming our way. If we were going to help Nick, we'd have to do it ourselves. Chapter 62 It seemed every light in the inn was on. Susan and I had come through the woods and along the narrow beach to the property, hoping to shelter from sight by the cars parked along the tree line. We crouched by the bumper of Vinny's sedan and watched the house for movement. But there was none. Blinds were drawn on the lower floors and the porch doors were hanging open, being pushed back and forth gently in the breeze. I looked over at the open doors of the garage and counted cars along with those parked at the tree line. Angelica, Clay, and Effie all had cars missing from the lot, as well as April Leeler and her son, whose bronze van had been parked at the end of the garage. Nettie Ives didn't own a vehicle. Aside from Vinny's sedan and Nick's car, there was only one other car in the lot, a sleek black car parked right by the edge of the porch. It took me a moment to recognize the rental. Carly Breacher, I said. Susan looked grave but nodded. Her instincts were as good, if not better, than mine, and to her, too, it all made sense, which meant that Breacher was either inside the house with Nick and in danger from the four bad guys Effie had mentioned, or she was one of the bad guys. It's a hell of a thing to sneak into your own home, to try to be silent and watchful and alert for danger, while at every step signs of violence present themselves. There was glass on the pavement outside the laundry window. The frame bashed and shattered, muddy footprints on the windowsill. The mind wants to respond to each sign of defilement with a singular burst of rage. That someone would break my window. That someone would knock over my shelves. By the time Susan and I reached the hall, it was clear that someone had been injured and had fled, perhaps through the kitchen door. There were blood spatters, dark and heavy on the floorboards, smears on the walls. The kitchen was trashed. We stood and listened at the kitchen doorway, systematically discounting each individual chime of the strange music the house always played. Pipes creaking, roof beams relaxing out of the warmth of the day, and the branches of those trees that could reach the house brushing against the weatherboards. Susan touched my wrist, and I met her questioning eyes. She and I seemed to understand simultaneously 
how bad this was. The silence. There were supposed to be at least five people here. I slipped into the dining room and covered my mouth with my hand to stifle a shocked groan at the sight of Vinny slumped back in his wheelchair, a bullet in his head. His collar told me he was dead, but I went to him anyway, put a finger into his cooling jugular, and felt nothing. Someone had been lying bleeding badly by the foot of an armchair. Susan appeared in the doorway, her face a sickly shade of gray, even before she'd taken in the sight of Vinny in the chair. She had to gulp a couple of times to get the words out. Two dead in the dining room, she whispered. I had the same kind of trouble getting the words out myself. Is it Nick? She shook her head. Don't know them. Driver's guys, looks like. Breacher was here, I said, my mind racing, and driver at the same time. Susan and I stared at each other, each trying to understand. I didn't like the coincidental nature of it, the idea that Driver and his men might have been waiting in the forest for something to draw Effie's attention away from her watch point, and that very thing arriving conveniently in the form of Carly Breacher. I didn't have time to think longer on that awful scenario, to try to fit the pieces together, before my life nearly ended then and there, in the doorway of the dining room, in my own home, my girlfriend looking at me, my possessions and my world in tatters. But the bullet driver fired from the end of the hall only nicked my left ear. The pain came afterward. Before I had a sense of what was happening, I was thrown sideways into the wall, the whole side of my head throbbing like I'd been punched. Susan ducked instinctively, turned and whipped out her own gun. Two more shots peppered into the floorboards at my feet. Susan fired a couple of shots at Driver as he disappeared around a corner, heading for the stairwell. We pursued. Chapter 63 Susan paused with me at the base of the stairs. I heard signs of life in the house for the first time since we had arrived. I was surprised at Driver's stealth for his stockiness. As he retreated upstairs, I heard a floorboard or two creak. A piece of furniture moved slightly on a rug, pushed aside. Susan and I waited, silently plotting, trying to breathe through the adrenaline spike that the quick gunfight had inspired in both of us. The stairwell was the most dangerous way for us to get upstairs. All Driver had to do was turn the corner and shoot down at us. We would have no cover whatsoever. Susan stepped close to me, her breath hot and damp on my face. We need to draw him away from the top of the stairs, she said. You go back out through the laundry, climb the drain pipe, and get in through one of the upstairs rooms. Draw him to you, and I'll come up behind him. He'll see a move like that coming a mile away, I said, and shook my head. If he hears a noise up there in one of the rooms, he'll be sure it's me. Not if he thinks we're both still down here, Susan said. She pointed and I peeked carefully around the corner of the stairwell. I could just see the tip of Driver's shoe at the edge of the baseboard. It moved, and I looked up in time to see him duck back around the corner, having taken a moment to do the same thing, trying to catch a glimpse of the enemy. I slipped my shoe off and crouched, positioning the toe of the shoe at the very edge of the baseboard so that it was visible to Driver from his position at the top of the stairs. As I backed away, Susan dashed across the bottom of the stairs. Two pops arrived from upstairs, the bullets puncturing the wall beside us, narrowly missing her as she arrived on the other side of the doorway. I heard the boards creak upstairs again as Driver leaned out to see if he'd hit her. Susan glanced at me and smiled, nodding. For all Driver knew, we were both still positioned at the edges of the doorway at the bottom of the stairs. I crept back through the eerily silent house to the laundry and slipped out the door into the night. Chapter 64 Nick Jones walked through the dark forest. Between the whispers of his footsteps on the dry leaves came Breacher's footsteps from somewhere not far behind them and to the right, so that the rhythmic beat of their journey kept a quick pace in his mind. 
Crickets and nightbirds abruptly stopped their sounds as the two humans made their way further and further into the blackness. The sea appeared beyond the reach of the forest, seeming to glow. No wave sounds. Nick watched it as he walked, trying not to think about the gun at his back. Okay, Breacher said. We're out. Tell me the password. Nick stopped walking. He turned around, expecting the lights of the house to be a speck in the distance. But they were nowhere in sight. He decided he must have walked farther than it seemed he did, his mind twisted by worry and fear. If I tell you, you'll just shoot me, Nick said. I'll give you the password when I'm safe. That doesn't work, Breacher barked, throwing her hands up. What? I'm supposed to just let you go and I, I just hope you'll shout the password back at me? Tell me the fucking password. We're running out of time. You'll just have to trust me, Nick said. You have to trust that I don't want the world to know what we did any more than you do. Oh, I don't know if that's true, Breacher snorted bitterly. Part of me thinks you'd really love wallowing for the rest of your life in a military prison. You've been a miserable, self-involved dope ever since that guy in the cornfield. Nick balled his fists as he remembered. They'd been approaching a hostile village south of Bari Kol. He'd only been on the ground three weeks. He was young, unscarred, still flinching at the sound of gunfire. Nick and Master had been working their way through a cornfield side by side when they'd happened upon a man in dusty jeans and a sweat-stained shirt. Forties, maybe. The guy had frozen at the sight of them, a stick in one hand and a ball cap in the other. Just a man taking a stroll through a cornfield on a nice clear morning. Nick's training had kicked in. There was no decision, no weighing the danger of escorting him out of the red zone, only to have him come back and warn the villagers of their approach. Nick had shot the man in the head. It was his first kill ever, a civilian. Nick had held it together through the occupation of the village, back to the base, out onto patrol. He'd finally cracked in front of Breacher, only her, in the quiet of an empty mess hall in the early hours of the morning after his patrol had returned. Nick had always believed his first kill would be the thing that shut off the emotions, the pain, his blooding. War was supposed to be easy after that, but instead, that had been the moment he became lost, irredeemable. The password, Breacher growled. Tell me. Nick said nothing. She lowered the gun and shot him in the kneecap. The pain didn't register at first. It was so extreme, so overwhelming, that his mind simply blocked it. Nick went down, clutching the limb, warm blood rushing between his fingers. Then the pain rippled around his body like a shockwave, a plunging into icy water. It stole his breath so that he gasped against the grass and leaves for a moment before he had enough air to wail. The password or I'll put a bullet in the other one, Breacher said. Okay, he breathed. Okay, okay. He murmured the letters, the numbers. In the blackness of the night, she raised the phone and started to type. The phone bleeped as it accepted her login. It was the moment of distraction he needed. Nick lunged sideways at her legs, defying the pain that wanted to seize every muscle in his body. Breacher fell on her backside on the forest floor, her lower legs encircled in his arms, both phone and gun flying from her hands. Nick scrambled for the pistol, dragging his injured leg behind him. Breacher's weight suddenly on his back, her fingers raking at his as he grabbed the weapon. The blood on his fingers made grip impossible. She took the gun from him easily, and he rolled over underneath her and looked up at her as she pressed the barrel to his chin. The phone bleeped, a single high-pitched chime in the stillness of the woods. We didn't have to do this, she said. You could have made it much easier on me. I guess I really am a glutton for punishment, Nick groaned. The phone bleeped again, and again. Breacher shivered, her finger sliding in the blood on the trigger. The phone bleeped again. What? What the hell is that? she asked. Nick smiled beneath her. She got off him, 
holding the gun in his face as she backed toward the glowing phone screen sitting up against the base of a nearby tree. Breacher took her eyes off Nick for half a second to glance at the phone in her hand. She glimpsed all that she needed to, a mess of notifications springing up one after the other, a sea of sky-blue boxes and white birds, the phone vibrating as retweets went flying. The alerts wouldn't stop. Ding, 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 ding. No, Breacher said, swallowing hard. No. You said seven. You said seven o'clock. He listened to her panting as she put it all together, that he'd lied, that he had indeed wanted it all to come out, that he was the miserable, self-obsessed, guilt-riddled mess she'd said he was, that he'd scheduled the video to go live at 6.50 p.m., not 7 p.m., just in case. She threw the phone against a tree and came marching back to him. He felt the gun against his temple. You're gonna die now, Nick, Breacher said. Not if you still want that million dollars, Nick replied. Chapter 65 Nick listened, waiting, hearing only her breathing. He knew what would come next, an enveloping whump as the bullet entered his brain, splitting his skull, closing him in blessed blackness. Or her voice. Her hips were on his, her legs straddling him. They'd been in this position before, a million years ago, earlier this same day. In Nick's bed. He put his hands on her thighs and remembered, relished the absurdity of it all. We can't go back to the house, she said finally. Relief, temporary, but still delicious, washed over him, competing with the pain of his shattered knee. They'll kill us. Driver will know I took out his guys. I... You think I'm dumb enough to keep that kind of money in the house? Nick asked. She was silent. His head spun, pain and blood loss already dragging at him. You're bullshitting me, she finally said. You must have searched my room while I was sleeping, right? Nick asked. Didn't find it. So if I'd stashed it in the house, it must have been somewhere outside my own room. You think I'm that stupid? I'd leave it where it could be discovered by another guest? We have strangers coming in and out of the house every week. It would be too risky. You could have hidden it anywhere, Breacher said. Her voice was quivering. The phone was still dinging insanely fast as person after person discovered and shared Nick's confession video, the horror of what they'd done. You, you probably stuffed the million dollars in a safe deposit box somewhere. It's in these woods, Nick said. Bull shit! she roared, jamming the gun in his jaw so hard his teeth clacked together. Bullshit, Nick! Why in the name of God would I trust you now? Because you have to, Nick said. You're done, Breacher. It's over. It's over for you. You thought you were desperate before? Try being on the run for covering up a goddamn massacre of civilians. By tomorrow morning, all our faces will be on every television screen in America. They will never stop looking for you. I don't trust you, she sobbed suddenly. Trust your instincts then, Nick said. Why would I put the money in a safe deposit box or a bank? Why would I put it somewhere it could be discovered by other people? I wouldn't do that. You know me. I'm not an idiot. I'd put it somewhere that I could access it quickly in case you or Dorich or Master ever did what I just did and told the whole world our little secret. I would put it in a bug-out bag here in these woods. You know that. It's the smartest thing to do. She was quiet again, calculating. Nick gripped her thighs and willed himself not to pass out. Is it far? she asked. No. So show me. You'll have to uh, help me up, Nick gasped. No way. Breacher got up and kicked him over. You can crawl like the rat you are. Chapter 66 I tried to remember the last time I'd scaled a drain pipe as I pulled myself hand over hand up the side of my house. I'd done it a few times on the job, especially as a rookie. You always send the new guy up over the roof. New guys are disposable. 
I gripped the sill below Nettie Ives' window, thinking to myself how much easier it had been all those years ago. My socked feet found purchase on the window frame below, and I hauled myself up, praying Nettie's window wasn't latched. It wasn't. I inched it open, imagining the nose of driver's gun edging around the curtain, the blast of light that would end me. There was a clock ticking in the darkened room somewhere. I pushed the curtains all the way back to give myself some moonlight. I was stunned for a moment by what I saw. The recluse's room was strangely orderly. I'd always imagined a hoarder's nest, but two walls were lined with filing cabinets, the drawers neatly labeled, eyewitnesses, case notes, crime scene. Above the bed, the wall was completely covered with photographs, newspaper articles, little pink sticky notes. Trying to drag myself away from my curiosity, my eyes caught headlines as I headed for the door. Police Hunt Husband in Shelley Ives' Disappearance Spencer Edward Ives, sentenced to 30 years I put my hand on the doorknob and froze. I'd been hoping to silently twist the knob, pull open the door, and check where Driver was in the hall. But as I gripped the cold brass in the dark, I realized the knob was one of the old-style ones that had existed in the inn when I bought it. I'd replaced every knob the year before, but was unable to get access to Ned's room, so this one remained. It was likely squeaky or rattly, like the others had been. I had no choice but to yank open the door and hope I caught Driver by surprise, if he was indeed still standing at the top of the stairs. I took my hand off the knob, lay flat on the floor, and tried to look down the hall through the crack in the bottom of the door. I couldn't see far enough. Taking the knob again, I filled my lungs with air, held my breath, and pulled open the door. The door smacked against the latch holding it shut. I looked up, spotted the latch and bolt that I'd completely missed in the semi-darkness, sitting at the very top of the door. It was a makeshift hidden lock, accessible from the outside, something Nettie must have installed himself. There wasn't time to do much more than fling myself sideways as Driver arrived at the other side of the door and started firing. Gold light speared through the room from the bullet holes in the door. I fired back and heard a scream I recognized. In my terror, I saw a flash of blonde hair through the bullet holes as Susan collapsed outside the door. Chapter 67 My hands were numb as I ripped the slide bolt down, yanked open the door, and found her there. Nothing made sense. The hallway was empty except for Susan, who was crumpled against the wall gripping the hole I'd put in her upper chest. Somehow, I was aware of the wail of horror that was coming out of me, but I was unable to stop it. I gathered up my girlfriend and held her against my chest. Down the hall, I spied the open window driver must have slipped out of. I thought you were him! I screamed. Susan's face was white and rigid with shock. Her hands were tangled in my shirt. She gave a little nod like, yes, she thought the same thing of me. That Driver had indeed anticipated our plan and gone into Nettie Ives' room to wait for me. I held her and growled in fury at myself for just a second, unable to stop the regret leaving my body in a long, animalistic sound. Then I picked her up and ran for the stairs. Chapter 68 Norman Driver edged his way along the side of the darkened inn, gripping a gutter with his stubby fingers and shuffling his boots along a ledge beneath the window. He was out. He'd had enough. Even before Bill Robinson and the blonde woman had boxed him in at the top of the stairs, he decided it was time to cut and run. Whatever Carly Breacher's promise had been to him about a share in a million dollars cash hidden somewhere inside the inn by the sea, that seemed to be over. Driver had been searching a linen cupboard, crowded with towels and sheets, when he heard two pops on the first floor. He'd gone down and found his two men dead, and Breacher and the others nowhere to be seen. Weird. 
He'd figured he would keep searching the upper rooms, at least until he heard tires on the road outside. But what he discovered in those rooms had only furthered his unease. The room with the obvious murder investigation going on in it had been followed by what looked like a psychopath's room, a pull-up bar, bed, gun case, and nothing else except what seemed to be an enormous rat wearing a pet collar. It was all too much, all too unexplainable. Driver had decided to hightail it and deal with the problem of Shauna Bulger in the box of evidence another time when he spotted Bill in the blonde sneaking up to the laundry door. Driver got to the awning over the porch, clambered down onto the railing, and dropped to the ground. More gunshots upstairs. He didn't stick around to find out who'd shot who. He took off running through the woods, following the road but sticking off it by a few yards, just to be safe. With every step, his heartbeat eased. He was beginning to think ahead, to collect himself. The long, dark stretch of woods before him and the rhythmic beat of his boots on the earth lent itself to calm planning. He'd get out of town for a few days, reevaluate. Sure, he'd lost guys. He'd underestimated the old woman and her loopy friends. But every boxer worth his salt took a couple of unlucky bops in the ring before they landed the big KO. It was just how fights went. And then, she was there. It was as though his very thoughts had summoned her. Driver stopped running and stood in the dark like a rabbit in the crosshairs, gaping at her, the woman who had brought him so much trouble and pain and humiliation. She was like a ghost outlined in white moonlight, the rifle hitched against her shoulder confidently, her features set as she watched him approach like she'd known all along he was coming. Driver felt his entire body shrink into itself with terror as she dropped the forestock of the rifle into her palm, slid back the bolt with her other hand. The clunk sound of the bullet locking into the chamber and the crunch of the slide bolt settling back into its housing seemed deafening to Driver. They were the brutal sounds heralding his final moments. She didn't say anything. She just eased her finger onto the trigger and pulled. Chapter 69 Nothing happened. Driver waited, his breath seized in his chest. The old woman lowered the weapon, clicked the trigger again, listened to something within the instrument grinding impotently. The gun had jammed. Driver released the breath trapped in his lungs and rushed forward as Shauna Bulger tried jimmying and shoving the locked slide bolt. The rifle went off right next to Driver's ear as he plowed into her. He felt the bones of her ribcage crunching and twisting as their bodies came together, the air leaving her in a whoosh by his cheek as they hit the ground. Despite how small she was, she scrambled and twisted under him without even taking a second to recover from the blow. She was somehow unstoppable, unkillable though her breath was rattling and her eyes bulged with pain. Driver had heard people say their life flashes before their eyes as they approached the edge of death. He'd always found a similar phenomenon to be true. When he took a life, the lives of those he'd already taken came to him, encouraging reminders of conquests past. There was Georgette there, in the old woman's eyes, but also a string of other women and girls drug dealers and loan sharks who had crossed him, a couple of crooked cops who got too big for their boots. Shauna Bulger did what all the women he'd killed did. She reached for something, anything to blind him with. He saw the handful of dirt coming and caught it, pinned her wrist to the ground. But a heavy boom and a flash in the distance distracted him, and he turned away at just the right moment and didn't see the rock she'd clutched in her other hand coming at his face. Driver caught the rock in his left eye socket. His whole face clanged with pain, the agony seeming to shimmer and echo through him, like his bones were made of iron. He got up and stumbled back, wiping blood from his face. His boots hit the dirt road, and he turned in time to be blinded by a set of huge gold headlights only a few yards away. Chapter 70 
Norman Driver took the full force of the car's bumper in the front of his legs. I caught a glimpse of his shocked face as I came roaring up the dirt road from the inn. I'd grabbed the keys to Vinny's sedan from a hook in the hall. The car was old and powerful and had a lot of weight behind it. Susan screamed in the passenger seat beside me, her strength failing and the life draining out of her, but not enough to disguise the crash from her senses. Driver's shoulder collapsed the windshield in front of us, and I heard his body tumble over the roof of the car, thumping onto the road behind. I slammed on the brakes, threw the car into park, and leapt out. But by the time I reached his body, I knew it was too late. His back was twisted unnaturally, his breathless, hairy chest exposed through his torn shirt. I looked into the woods, spying movement. Shauna was standing there, a rifle in her hands, heaving with exertion. The urgency with which I'd moved since shooting Susan was still with me. I reached out to Shauna even as I was backing away, retreating to the driver's seat of the car. Come on, I called. I was offering her one final out, a peaceful surrender. She could come with me and end this dark journey she had begun. Yes, it would mean jail time. It would mean facing her son, her friends, her family through the chipped and scratched glass in the prison visiting room, probably for the rest of her life. It would mean being punished for being a punisher, for taking revenge, for stepping outside the law just exactly as her husband had. I knew those were terrifying prospects for Shauna, or for anyone. But if she did not come with me now, wherever she was going could only be more frightening. I left my hand hanging for a second, maybe two. Shauna didn't budge. I pulled the door of the car closed and drove away. Chapter 71 Nick crawled. The sound of the phone dinging became more distant, but never slowed. A one-note piano tune stuttering through the night. In time, he stopped and gripped his shattered knee, bit down against the pain for long moments as Breacher stood by silently, only part of her silhouette visible against the glowing ocean. He could hear the waves now tiny three- or four-inch high slaps of white foam illuminated in the moonlight. He stopped in sight of the tree. He'd picked it because it stood alone, a young pine with a wide base, separated from its brethren by ten feet on all sides. He liked that about it, that it didn't fit in. He reached out, pointed, and lay his tired head on the ground. It's there, Nick said, at the base. On this side, it's not deep. Breacher paused, examined the tree at the edge of the forest, its roots half in and half out of the pale sand. When I dig it up, am I going to need some other kind of goddamn password or code to open it? She barked. Nick gave a little laugh, despite the agony he was in. <laughs> I guess you'll find out, he said. She went to the tree, dropped to her knees, and started digging with her hands. When Nick tried to roll himself onto his side to take the weight off his leg, she popped up, grabbing the gun and training it on him. Don't, she snapped. Stay back, well back. I will, he nodded. I will. He listened to her fingers digging in the sandy soil, the rustling of the duffel bag as she prized it from the grip of the earth. Nick heard the zipper jangle and whiz as she pulled it. He tucked his head beneath his arm and felt the explosion thump through the ground beneath him. Chapter 72 The motel had been revamped since back when Clay had started as a lieutenant in Gloucester. As a rookie, he'd attended domestic disputes here, a couple of suicides, reports of suspicious activity. Now, as he knocked and entered April Leeler's room, he found the crisp whiteness of everything almost unsettling, laboratory-like. Joe was curled up on the small twin bed, playing with his iPad, his feet wiggling off the edge of the mattress. April was waiting for Clay, sitting on the edge of the bed, her eyes full of concern. Clay went and sat beside her, and just like the supportive and caring wife that he'd envisioned in his fantasies, she took his head against her shoulder and played with the curls behind his ears. 
Oh, he said, a single encore note to the miserable phone call he'd finished with her only ten minutes earlier. How long can you stay? she asked. Not long, he said. I just swung by to tell Angelica that Finney's dead. I don't want her to hear it somewhere else. She's down in room seven. He closed his eyes and counted off seconds in April's delicious embrace, before he had to get back out there. In truth, he didn't even know exactly where he should go after he left the little motel at the edge of town. Most of his officers were manning the inn, waiting for a forensics unit to come up from Boston to deal with the crime scene there. Three dead bodies in the house, one on the road leading in. And then there was the explosion and secondary crime scene in the woods. Nick had called Clay from the edge of the water, deep in the forest, to alert him to the explosion scene and to get him to send an ambulance out for a devastating gunshot wound to the knee. There was another body there, Carly Breacher. Nick had assured a stunned Sheriff Clay that the hand grenade he'd taken from Effie's room and rigged to the inside of the buried bag was the only explosive in the woods. But Clay had protocol to follow. More vans from Boston. Nettie, Susan, and Nick were all in surgery. Clay had stopped by the hospital to find Bill tearing his hair out with only Effie there to comfort him. Shauna Bulger was still out there somewhere, running around with a rifle that could take out an airplane. Clay pulled away from April and held his throbbing forehead. Joe looked over. Shouldn't you be asleep? Clay asked the child. I've been saying that for the last four hours, April said. Clay frowned at the boy who paid them no mind. Clay sighed again. What can I do? April asked, one hand still lifting and twirling those curls behind his ear. Is there some way I can help? I don't know Angelica well, but maybe I could go with you to her room. I'll comfort her after you have to move on. I wouldn't ask you to do that, Clay said. He had to laugh despite it all. <laughs> Man, you wait so long for a wonderful person to turn up in your life. And when she does, it's in the middle of a catastrophe. She held him again. Don't start kissing, <clears throat> Joe warned from the other bed. Clay looked up. The kid hadn't lifted his eyes from the iPad yet. It's gross, gross, gross! That reminds me. Clay, I think I left a pair of sunglasses in the cruiser yesterday, April said, rising from the bed. Can I just... Sure, sure. Clay waved her away. He went and sat beside Joe as April left the motel room. There were pillow mints on the nightstand. Clay unwrapped one and popped it in his mouth, thinking he probably wouldn't get a minute to eat again before daybreak. Joe's index finger was dancing over the screen, helping a cartoon kangaroo hop over obstacles on an outback landscape. Isn't it a little past your bedtime, buddy? Clay asked. Maybe, Joe said and smiled. But don't tell my mom. I think she forgot. She's been waiting for you to get here. I've got a whole bunch of new games I haven't even played yet, and I want to stay up as long as I can. Clay sat and watched as the kid closed the kangaroo game and opened another. After the game designer logos appeared and dissolved, a scroll flopped down. On its surface were cartoon body parts. Joe started building an avatar, fitting a little girl's head onto a petite body. Clay watched him add a blonde wig, a dress, Mary Jane shoes. When the game demanded, Name your character, Joe tapped three letters, Z-O-E. Clay felt tingles roll over the surface of his scalp. They weren't there, April said as she reappeared at the door. Clay watched her cross to the bed, looking defeated, and curl up there again, taking the paperback novel she'd been reading from the nightstand. With almost mechanical movements, Clay went to her, kissed her, and issued his goodbyes. He walked stiffly to his cruiser and sat in the driver's seat, tapping his fingers on the bottom of the steering wheel. It was with a dread so heavy and so aching in his chest that he turned his head and looked at the mobile digital terminal mounted to the center console of the squad car. 
the monitor was turned toward the front passenger seat, the way it had been the last time April was in the car. He hadn't left it like that. Clay turned it back. He awakened the machine, tapped through to the search history, and squinted at the top of the list where the most recent search was positioned. He put a finger on the screen and found the time of the last search. 11.47 p.m. He looked at his watch. It was 11.52 p.m. Clay hit the search record and opened it up. The file related to a man named Thomas Oscar Savage. One conviction four years earlier for speeding. That was it. But there was a red alert on the name and a license plate linked to it. Clay clicked the alert. Wanted. Suspected homicide. Possible armed hostile. Clay took out his phone and googled the name Thomas Oscar Savage. His phone screen filled with headlines. Omaha Police Appeal for Information in Missing Child Case Search for Missing Omaha Girl Suspended Missing Zoe Savage Presumed Murdered Savage Parents Interrogated Over Missing Daughter Regina Savage Arrested, Husband Thomas Still at Large Clay opened up one of the articles. He scrolled down to a shot of a terrified-looking couple sitting at a press conference table, surrounded by police. Thomas and Regina Savage. Thomas was crying, wiping his exhausted eyes. Regina was holding up a picture of a small child. Clay recognized that child. Chapter 73 Everything evaporated from his mind. The multiple crime scenes in and around his own home. The killer fugitive in the area that he personally had failed to keep contained. His three housemates in the local hospital, two of them fighting for their lives. Sheriff Clayton Spears even set aside his romantic disappointment, the most crushing letdown he'd experienced since his wife's departure. He could think of one thing only, which was that the little boy in the motel named Joe Leeler was, in fact, actually a little girl named Zoe Savage, who had been kidnapped from her parents in Omaha and had somehow ended up here. All the stupid ideas Clay had been building up for years about what kind of a hero he wanted to be in life went up in smoke instantly. He had to be a different kind of hero now. Clay felt the muscles in his shoulders bunching, his hands balling into fists and his jaw locking tight. He got out of his squad car, slammed the door shut, and strode the six paces to the motel room door like a death machine lumbering robotically toward human prey. The lock smashed out of the door frame as his boot hit the wood, the hinges popping, the whole door falling flat on the carpet with a breathy whump. Zoe screamed in shock and dropped her iPad, leaping up and scrambling to the bed beside April. The woman wrapped an arm around the child. Clay felt his lip twist in fury. When he spoke, every word came out with a struggle, the syllables wrapped in pure, white-hot anger. Zoe, Clay said. He put out a hand. Come here. The child looked at April. April's hand tightened on the kid's shoulder. I'm going to take you home, Clay said. He put a hand on the butt of the pistol on his hip. We're going to stay real calm, all of us, nice and calm and quiet. You're going to come over here and stand by me, and I'm going to take you home to your real parents. Zoe started crying. Clay eased a breath through his nostrils that was hot on his upper lip. April scooted the little girl closer to her, her other hand creeping up the surface of her thigh toward her pocket. I am Joe's real parent, April said. Her eyes held none of the warmth and light Clay had so fixated on when he first met her. They were almost unseeing, but glared into his own. Don't, Clay said. The hand that had beckoned the child was now turning making a stop sign. His eyes warned her. April, do not move. I don't want to pull a gun in this room. Not in front of the kid. Not... 
This is my child, April insisted, her hands still moving. Suddenly, her fingers shot to her pocket. I'm... Clay pulled out his gun and fired once. Later, Clay would recall the sound of the blast and wonder if his own personal heartache had made him do it. Maybe it was because Shauna Bolger had already tricked him earlier that night. Maybe all his trust was used up. Maybe the good nature that sometimes got him in a pickle on the job had been eroded to a point that it failed to launch. He didn't know. But Clay shot the woman who only moments earlier he'd considered the potential love of his life. A part of him hoped the reason he did it was his love and fear for the child she had abducted. April flopped off the bed and onto the floor. Clay dropped his gun, ran forward, and scooped up the stiff and numb little girl. He carried her out of the room, using the weight of her in his arms to fuel one last little dream about having a child of his own. He glanced back and spied the handle of the knife April had been going for, butting out of the pocket of her jeans. Chapter 74 Vending machine, magazine stand, row of chairs, bank of payphones. I recited the names of the four points of my pacing route around the hospital waiting room. I didn't know how many laps I'd done, but I could see my endless route was starting to annoy Effie. She watched me going around and around from the back row of the room full of chairs. She fit right in there, her shirt drenched in Nettie Ives's blood and her eyes full of turmoil. To her left, three seats down, a father was clutching a wad of bandages to a blood-smeared toddler's forehead, and on her right, a guy with a possibly broken foot was lounging in a wheelchair, head bent forward, tapping at his phone. I went and sat beside Effie, wringing my hands between my legs. Tell me again what happened at the house with Nick and Breacher, I said. Effie rolled her eyes, handed me her phone. I could read for myself the story she had written out for me, unable to explain an ordeal that long and awful with her makeshift sign language. I pushed the phone away without reading it, thought about going back to pacing. Maybe I'd try going in the opposite direction. Effie put a hand on my leg and mouthed words that were clear, especially from the expression in her eyes. Calm down. I can't do this again. I said, shaking my head, ignoring her direction. I pointed to a chair in the front row. See that chair there? That's where I sat waiting for the doctors to tell me that my wife hadn't made it. Four hours I sat there. You see the sign out front when you came in? That's where they told me about Marnie. Effie nodded knowingly. I can't lose Susan, I said. I can't do it again. I can't lose someone again. Effie gripped my hand, tried to say something, but I didn't look. The words were tumbling out of me, darker and darker, spiraling down. I stopped for Norman Driver, I said. My voice quivered. I paused for a long time in case I lost it, only speaking again when I was sure I could get the words out. I hit him with the car. He just came out of the woods really suddenly and... Before I could slam on the brakes, bam! It was an accident. I stopped and went to see if he was alive, if there was something I could do. Effie shrugged. So? So what if those few seconds make a difference, I asked. What if, you know, if she dies and it turns out that she might have survived if I had just got her to the hospital a few seconds earlier? I did a stupid, stupid thing, Effie. I shot her. And then I did another stupid thing. I stopped to see if some goddamn worthless, murdering, drug-dealing piece of trash could be saved. What if I... Effie grabbed my cheek with one hand and turned my face toward her, hard. Cut it out, she mouthed. I stopped. Effie tapped a message out on her phone, showed it to me. You stopped for Shauna because you're a good man. I wasn't convinced so I went back to pacing around the room. Vending machine, magazine stand, row of chairs, bank of payphones. I was trying to decide how many seconds I'd given Shauna Bolger to get into the car with me 
when a nurse came through the double doors beside the triage desk and walked up to Effie. I sprinted over to be at her side. Your friend, Mr. Ives, is out of surgery and is stable now, the nurse said. But he's unconscious. He's had a difficult time. I'm afraid I won't be able to let anyone other than immediate family in to sit with him. Effie nodded, and the nurse walked away. They're not going to let me in to see her, I said. Effie looked up at me. If she survives, I said, Susan, I I'm not her immediate family. Effie hung an elbow over the back of her chair and tapped a message out on her phone with one thumb. Better settle in then. Could be here a while. Chapter 75 Sheriff Clay Spears walked up the ramp to Gate 12 at Epley Airfield in Omaha at about midday, the little girl named Zoe Savage holding his hand. Clay was tired himself, but the kid was barely awake at all. For the whole flight from Beverly Regional, the girl had slept with her head against the window, her mouth hanging open and little snores coming from her now and then as she was disturbed by turbulence or the flight attendant's cart going by. Clay had sat and watched the child, thinking that now that he knew she was a little girl and not a little boy, he wasn't sure how he could have missed the distinction. They talked a little, back at the station in Gloucester, Clay stepping out of the little waiting room he'd settled the kid into to deal with multiple crime scenes. Mostly, though, Clay wasn't sure what to say to the girl. It was possible, he assumed, that he could make matters worse by trying to explain it all to her how April Leeler had abducted her, how her parents had been charged with her murder, how her father was a fugitive. Clay thought he'd best leave that kind of thing to a child psychologist. He listened to what the kids said about her time with April Leeler, but didn't comment on it. He'd almost known the kind of stories Zoe would tell, even before the child spoke. That April Leeler had been a teacher at Zoe's school, that she'd been so nice and friendly how she'd hustled Zoe into her car one afternoon, telling the kid wild stories about her parents not wanting her to be their daughter anymore. April had convinced Zoe that she was protecting her from her parents, who wanted to kill her, and that adopting a new identity, that of a little boy named Joe, would be their only safe option. April had shaved Zoe's head, bought her boy's clothes from the local Walmart, and driven the two of them out of the state as fast as she could. What Zoe couldn't tell Clay was why April had done it. What sadistic malfunction in the woman's mind, or gaping hole in her soul, had made her abduct a child? And Clay didn't want to know. It hurt so bad learning that April wasn't the woman he'd thought she was. Learning more about that lie felt like unnecessary agony. Zoe Savage waited silently, rubbing her eyes and leaning a little against Clay's leg as two detectives from Omaha greeted them at the airport gate. They were standard police detective types, slightly overweight, world-worn, dressed in wrinkled suits. They introduced themselves as Detectives Hanley and Eraldson and stood there for what must have been a full minute, gaping silently at Zoe. Well... Jesus, Hanley said and ran a hand over his bald scalp. That's her, all right. I can't believe it. I'm standing here looking at her right now. I still can't believe it. It's like I'm looking at a goddamn unicorn. Eraldson shook his head at Clay. We had the parents dead to rights. I, I just feel like the ultimate fool. You rounded up the father yet? Clay asked. Yeah. Hanley said. Guy gave himself up when he saw the news report that you'd found Zoe in Gloucester. Boy, ain't he relieved. You found his daughter and you got him off the hook for murder. That man owes you a drink, Sheriff. Him and the mother, both. I don't think so, said Clay. He lifted a tired hand. I'm just going to turn around and catch the next flight back home. What? Eraldson laughed. Hell no, Sheriff Spears. You ain't going nowhere. We got a big reunion of this little one with her parents planned down at the station. 
Every news camera in the country is going to be there. You've got to enjoy your moment. You're the hero here, Hanley insisted. You can't just walk out on your time as a hero. Yes, I can, Clay said. While the detective stood there, gaping silently again, Clay crouched down and pulled Zoe Savage into a hug. He told her that she was a good girl, that she was brave, that everything was going to be okay. And then he shook hands with the detectives and walked down the concourse toward departures. Chapter 76 In the movies, when someone might be dying, their loved one sits in a waiting room for a few hours, just enough time to slowly rise from the hard plastic chair at any sign of news looking slightly stale and tired. It didn't work out like that for me. For the first six hours after I drove Susan to the hospital, I did sit and rise and pace and wait, looking stale and tired, and no more, and there were many possible signs of news. But the news didn't come. Eventually, Effie went away, and I was told that Nick was in post-op for his shattered knee. I didn't go and visit him. The emergency department waiting room seemed to be where the nurses expected to find me, so that's where I stayed. When the news came, it was not the definitive, she made it, of Hollywood movies. There was no one around to high-five and hug me. I'd been waiting eight hours, and they told me that Susan was resting from her first surgery and was about to go in for another round. They couldn't tell me if she would live or die, or under what circumstances either might happen. After a day, my beard stubble was appearing and my clothes were reeking from worry sweat. They told me that they'd had to remove half of Susan's left lung, as it had been torn to shreds by the bullet. They couldn't tell me if she was in or out of the proverbial woods. After two days, my hair was crazy and my eyes were wild from lack of sleep and refusal of food. They told me Susan was in an induced coma, which was bad but there was no sign of brain damage, which was good. After three days, I was walking like a zombie, from catching naps in corners, on chairs, on a bench outside the waiting room doors, and while Effie had brought me new clothes, I hadn't put them on. My skin was oily, and my teeth were furry, and my thoughts were fragmented from stress. When I was sleeping, I heard the hospital's alarm and announcement system in my dreams and my eyes ached from the fluorescent lights. They said Susan was showing signs of waking. On the fourth day, I was roused from a drooling slumber propped against the vending machine, drawn there by its strangely soothing hum. It was a nurse who woke me. She said I was allowed to visit Susan. I ran, forgetting that I'd taken off my shoes and tucked them under the chair in the waiting room. In socked feet, I almost slid over as I was coming to a halt at the door of the room the nurse was pointing to. It was dark and warm inside. Sitting up in the bed, Susan was awake and waiting for me. Her eyes were sleepy, but she still frowned as she took me in. Bill, she said. Jesus, you look awful. I fell into the chair beside her bed and took her hand put her palm against my face. She made a sound that might have been a little laugh, had she been stronger, had it not hurt so much. I cradled her fingers against my face and just looked at her, thanking God or the universe or dumb luck or whatever the hell was responsible for her being alive with every ounce of my soul. I've got a question for you, I said eventually. Oh yeah, she said. Let me guess. You want to know if I forgive you for accidentally shooting me? You want to know if I'm that big of a woman? She was grinning at her own joke. That's right, I said. She paused, thinking, took back her hand and tapped a finger thoughtfully on her chin. Sure, what the hell, she said. I shot at you too, after all. Well, that's part one of my question answered then. It's a two-parter? Sure is. All right, Susan said. What's the second part? If you could go so far as to forgive me, I said, would you marry me too? Chapter 77 
Susan's smile broadened. I'd expected at least a little surprise at the proposal, but that's just the way she is. One step ahead of me all the time. While she seemed initially taken by joy at my question, something flickered for a moment in her eyes. I knew exactly what it was. Doubt. Fear. Because if the last few days had confirmed anything for her, it was surely that I was a trouble magnet. It wasn't the house that sucked in ill fate, menace, and catastrophe. It was me. That malignant magnetism and my loyalties, my sense of responsibility for the injustices that arose for the people I loved, my sheer dog-headedness, it was all going to make me a very dangerous husband. And she'd had a dangerous husband before. But I hoped in that moment that she sat sitting there looking at me that Susan could also see the fear in my eyes. I'd lost a wife before. I'd nearly lost her, too. And I knew my propensity to find myself surrounded by bad people and bad deeds didn't just exist because I couldn't walk by and let evil be done. There was something about me, too. Maybe I was cursed. Being married to me would mean Susan was choosing to live the rest of her life in peril. The doubt disappeared from Susan's eyes. I don't know what happy thought about me pushed her over the edge, but she seemed to decide then and there that whatever was coming, I was worth dealing with it. Go take a shower and bring me a snack from the vending machine, she said. Do that, and you've got yourself a deal. Chapter 78 Effie and I got a bug into us in the weeks following that dark night at the house. We infected each other with the idea that we could expunge what had happened to us and our household by cleaning and repairing. So that's what we did. While Effie sanded, filled, and painted over bullet holes, I scrubbed blood from the walls and floorboards, hired a dumpster, and loaded it up with ruined rugs and carpet. On the day that Susan was due to return home from the hospital, I was putting fresh sheets on our bed in the warm light of morning, the sea beyond the round window making the slapping sounds of small, foamy waves and the gulls crying happily. As I breezed past, I spotted Effie through that little window. She was loading a slab of wood onto the rails of her circular saw, her hand flicking expertly as she marked the length for cutting with a pencil and steel ruler. She had commandeered a section of the lawn beyond the porch as her workshop, the grass around her powdered with sawdust and timber offcuts. I went down from the attic and along the second-floor hall, going from room to room. Susan had been tired and sore when I saw her last, and I knew she would probably just want to go straight to our bed, but I wanted everything to be as perfect as it could be anyway. The new door to Nettie Ives's room was slightly ajar and still damp from a fresh coat of paint, so I pushed it open gently to slip into the empty room. Over the days since I'd entered Nettie's room on that fateful night, I had returned a bunch of times to take in the investigation he was obviously conducting into a crime he had been convicted of, his wife's murder. From what I could tell, he pled guilty and served almost the entirety of his 30-year sentence, getting 10% knocked off for good behavior. Spencer Edward Ives, convicted killer, had a couple days more to spend in the local hospital, having developed complications with the bullet wound to his stomach. I dusted his room and stood there under the corkboard for a while, looking at the articles, photographs, and sticky notes he'd assembled. It was tempting, so tempting, to dig into what was here, to use the opportunity while my most mysterious tenant wasn't around to discover more about who he was and what had brought him here. That he had spent 27 years incarcerated for his wife's brutal murder explained why he felt so comfortable living in this tiny space, choosing to exist with only the walls as company. What wasn't explained was why he'd made this place a shrine to his obsession with his own case. I shook my head, forcing myself to look away from the wall of snippets, and left the room. From the window of Nick's room, the door to which had also been left ajar, I could see the troubled veteran returning from the woods. 
He was shambling slowly and awkwardly on crutches, and yet was as drenched in sweat as he used to be when returning from a five-mile run. No amount of new paint smell, sawdust, or air freshener had been able to rid the house of the dark cloud following Nick Jones around. His Twitter post confessing to his part in covering up the massacre in Afghanistan had garnered national attention. He had stirred up urgent activity in a variety of online groups, from QAnon to About Face, and every major news outlet had covered the story. I'd sat with him in his hospital room, expecting at any moment for the disgraced veteran to be hauled off by military police, or CIA officials, or someone, anyone, for interrogation about the incident. Men in suits did come, and they spoke to him alone, and when they left, my friend seemed even sadder and angrier than he'd been when I stepped out of the room. I found out why, soon enough. The U.S. Army released a statement the following day, discrediting Nick's story about what happened at the farmhouse in Afghanistan. Rick Master had stepped forward to act as the Army's calm, collected, and thoroughly rehearsed witness, claiming that the official military account of the 2010 incident was true. Dorich, Master, Breacher, and Jones had been fired upon by rebels and had responded within the parameters of their training, and while the killing of civilians was always unfortunate, in this instance it could not be avoided. The CIA, in a joint statement, said any claims Nick Jones made about ghost money were untrue and likely inspired by his known schizophrenia. Roger Dorich's death was ruled a suicide, and Carly Breacher's end in the woods near my inn was put down to an accident. I watched Nick limp on his crutches from the edge of the woods to the fire pit area and ease himself down on one of the benches there. Though I'd tried to broach the subject with him a couple of times since his release from the hospital, he'd not wanted to talk about his next steps in trying to be accountable for what he had done, if any. I assumed that the millions of fragments of singed American dollars that I was still finding scattered around the woods near the inn and along the nearby beach comprised all of the money in the duffel bag he'd used to blow up Carly Breacher. If Nick had saved any of it, or given any of it to another source, he wasn't telling me about it. I dusted Nick's room briefly, too, before moving on. When I pushed open the door of Vinny's room, I found Angelica there. I was unsurprised, since the author, raconteur, vegan, activist, and grieving sort of girlfriend, had been spending a lot of time in the deceased gangster's room. She didn't notice me as I entered, and I dusted the room silently, glancing up now and then to watch her poring over old photographs she was drawing, one at a time, from a shoebox sitting on the edge of the desk. No one had come to the house to claim Vinny's things, so she'd had unfettered access to his meager possessions and seemed to be working on something on her laptop as she carefully examined each image. I knew that when Angelica wasn't working on whatever she was doing with the photographs, she was putting together a memorial for Vinny. I'd heard her making calls to florists and undertakers, but asking her what we as a household could do to help or whether we'd be invited only made her walk off in silence. Though my inn was empty of short-term guests, and though those who lived here now included the survivors of gunshot wounds, hostage scenarios, public shamings, and brutal beatings, no character seemed to have taken the events of those dark days as hard as the man I found sitting in the dining room. Sheriff Clayton Spears was settled at the end of the table, idly tapping the side of a steaming mug of coffee with his palm, his huge back to the door through which I entered. Unlike the physical wounds of my other friends, Clay's heart seemed unhealable. I'd begun worrying about him when I learned that he had taken a leave of absence and I noticed him wearing the same T-shirt and jeans around the house for days on end. As I entered the dining room now, he didn't move, his eyes transfixed on the dust motes swirling in the beams of light entering through the French doors. My fiancé's coming home today, I announced cheerfully, dropping my dusting cloth on the table and taking a seat to Clay's right. You know the one, Susan. 
the blonde babe with the mind like a diamond. You might remember her as my girlfriend, but she's my fiancé now. That's because I asked her to marry me, and she said yes. Clay lifted his weary eyes to me. I grinned back, my insistence on using the word fiancé upwards of five hundred times a day was driving everyone in the household nuts. You know who I'm referring to, I pressed. Bill, please, Clay sighed. Hey, I was thinking we could get out of here later. You, me, and Nick, maybe, I said and gestured to the doors. Go down the pier with a couple of cold ones. I hear the yellow tail are biting. Maybe, Clay conceded. All right, it's settled. We're going. After my fiancé gets back. Clay looked like he wanted to smack me. I heard a car approaching the house. I was determined to get a half smile out of the sheriff before I went to see who it was. You think you'll be all right on a public pier dressed like that? I pointed at his T-shirt. Or should you go in disguise? We don't want the paparazzi bothering us. Clay's single-handed solving of the kidnapping of Zoe Savage from Omaha, Nebraska, had almost eclipsed Nick's revelations on the Internet. Footage of the little girl running into her exhausted parents' arms had become so familiar to me in the days I sat by Susan's hospital bed that I could have sketched the heartwarming scene from memory. Clayton Spears was being hailed as a hero from coast to coast, yet the attention only seemed to push the already shy sheriff further into his shell. I'd fielded a couple of phone calls from the savages and plenty from the media, but my friend had never accepted any of those calls and hadn't touched an enormous fruit and wine basket that arrived for him and landed in the inn's kitchen. Giving up on injecting any cheer into Clay, I went to the windows and looked out, spying a good-looking young woman exiting a blue rental car at the end of the porch. I intercepted her at the front door, feeling weirdly flushed at the sight of her, standing there straightening her crinkled business shirt and trousers. Auburn curls fell from a ponytail down the back of her neck, and she clicked a stainless steel pen nervously as she glanced past me into the foyer. Hello, she said and flashed a set of perfect white teeth. My name is Katie O'Leary. I was wondering if I could speak to Sheriff Clayton Spears. Chapter 79 I all but danced back into the dining room, shimmying to Clay's side and perching on the tabletop at his elbow. There's an incredibly attractive journalist here to see you, I told my friend. Uh-huh, Clay said, and lifted his coffee mug, making no move to stand. She wants to speak to the hero of the inn, I said. Sounds like it's mostly about the Zoe Savage thing. But she's also curious about you turning up in Boston with the missing evidence needed to solve the Georgette Winter Lee cold case. I'd let Clay hand in the evidence box Shauna Bolger had posted back to the inn from an unknown location considering that my reputation with the Boston police wouldn't help its already difficult chain of evidence situation. From what I'd heard, my former colleagues in the force had reopened the cases and were looking into the late Norman Driver's whereabouts in 1989, around the time of Georgette's brutal slaying. Convictions would be difficult, particularly without testimony from Mark Bolger about how he'd obtained the packages of evidence or from Shauna about how she'd retrieved the box from her husband's safe. Searches for Shauna had been undertaken in all of the woodland, from Crane Beach to Manchester by the sea, but no trace of her had been found. Wanted ads on the TV had dredged the bottom of the barrel, receiving the usual false sightings and rumors. But Shauna Bolger was gone. Whoever she had become when she was attacked in her home, she was living somewhere as that woman now, forgetting day by day the life that she had lived as Mark Bolger's wife and as my friend. Someone new, but not someone who would kill again. That was my guess, my hope, anyway. Clay sipped his coffee, and I nudged him so that he almost sloshed it over the edge of his cup as he set it back down. Come on, Clay, I needled, 
You never know. That woman waiting out there might be your future fiancé. Don't say it, Clay growled. He hid it well, but at the corner of his mouth, I saw the barest hint of a smile. I'll go out there and get rid of her, if you just don't say it. I watched him go, and in a few moments, the sheriff and the journalist appeared beyond the French doors. While at first the young woman seemed to be wincing against gruff proclamations and that unbreachable stop sign of a hand, I folded my arms and watched as Clay's posture slowly straightened and his lips grew into a smile while the two of them talked. Soon he was shrugging humbly, and she dropped a hip, looked like she was teasing him, making him laugh so that his belly jiggled. It made me feel warm and hopeful to watch Clay giving love another chance. I looked at my watch, calculating the hours until I needed to go and pick up my own second chance and bring her home. Black and Blue Chapter 1 I'm an experienced hunter of humans. It's not hard if you understand how they think. People have tunnel vision and are objective-driven. As long as you don't interfere with their goal and don't make yourself known before you're ready to pounce, you can close in on a relaxed target pretty easily. It doesn't even require much stealth. Unlike animals, human beings don't use their alarm system of senses. Though the wind was behind me, Ben Hammond didn't smell me. He didn't hear my breath over the clunk of his boots on the pavement. Hammond's objective was his late-model Honda Civic, on the edge of the parking lot. So that's all he could see. He didn't notice me round the corner from the loading dock and fall into step behind him. He left the shopping center with hands full of groceries swinging at his sides and headed across the parking lot, already sliding into the driver's seat in his mind, shutting the door on the moonless night. I followed with my head down my hoodie pulled up against the security cameras, trained on the few remaining cars. I let him pull his keys out of his pocket, the jangling sound covering the soft fall of my boots for the last few steps between me and my prey. I closed the distance and attacked. Chapter 2 Fuck! Ben Hammond grabbed at the back of his head where I'd punched him, turned and stumbled against the car, dropping the bags. Glass cracked in one of them. He cowered in a half-crouch, trying to make himself smaller. Both hands shot up. Oh, my God! W what are you doing? Stand up, I waved impatiently. Take my, my, my wallet, he stammered. Don't hurt me! You don't like the surprise attack, do you, Ben? You know how effective it is. He realized three things very quickly. First, that I was a woman. Second, that this wasn't a mugging. Third, that he'd heard my voice before. The man straightened almost fully and squinted into the darkness of my hood. I tugged the hood down and watched his eyes wander around the silhouette of my short hair against the shopping center lights, the terror in his face slowly dissipating. I... I he straightened, his hands dropped. I know you. You do? You're that cop. He pointed an uncertain finger at me, began to shake it as his confidence grew. You're that cop from the trial. I am, I said. Detective Harriet Blue, here to deliver your punishment. Chapter 3 It was a little insulting that my name didn't come to Ben's mind as quickly as I'd hoped, but I just cracked him on the skull. What little gray matter was sloshing around his brain probably needed time to recover. I'd done everything I could to make him aware of me while he was tried for the rape of his girlfriend, Molly. When I took the stand to testify that I'd found Molly at the bottom of the shower where he dumped her, I'd looked right at him and calmly and clearly stated my name. It hadn't been a solid case. Ben had been very crafty in getting back at his ex for leaving him raping and beating her, but charming his way into her apartment struggle-free and sharing a glass of wine with her first, so it looked as if she'd welcomed the sexual encounter. I'd known, sitting on the witness stand and staring at him, 
that like most rapists, he'd probably go free. But that didn't mean I was finished with him. This is assault. Ben touched the back of his head, noted the blood on his fingers, and almost smiled. You're in a lot of trouble, you stupid little bitch. Actually, I slid my right foot back, you're in a lot of trouble. I gave Ben a couple of sharp jabs to the face, then backed up, let him have a moment to feel them. He stepped out from between the shopping bags and came at me swinging. I sidestepped and planted my knee in his ribs, sending him sprawling on the asphalt. I glanced at the distant shopping center. The security guards would notice a commotion at the edge of the farthest parking lot camera and come running. I figured I had seconds, not minutes. You can't do this! Hammond spat blood from his split lip. You! I gave him a knee to the ribs, then lifted him before he could get a lungful of air and slammed him into the car's hood. I'm petite, but I box, so I know how to maneuver a big opponent. I grabbed a handful of Ben's hair and dragged him toward the driver's door. You're a cop! Hammond wailed. You're right, I said. I could just make out two security guards rushing out of the loading dock. My job gives me access to crime alerts, I said. I can tag a person's file and get a notification every time they're brought in, even if their original charge never stuck. I held on to Hammond's hair and gave him a couple of hard punches in the head, then dumped him onto the ground. The guards were closer. I stepped on Hammond's balls so I knew I had his full attention. If I ever see your name in the system again, I told him, I'm coming back, and I won't be this gentle next time. I pulled my hood up and sprinted into the bushes at the side of the lot. Chapter 4 I'm not a vigilante. Sometimes I just have no choice but to take matters into my own hands. I'd worked in sex crimes for five years, and I was tired of seeing predators walking free from convictions. When I got close to a victim, the way I did with Molly Finch, I found it hard to sleep after their attacker was acquitted. For weeks, I'd lain awake at night thinking about Hammond's smug face as he'd walk down the steps of the courthouse on Goulburn Street the wink he'd given me as he got into the taxi. I'd managed to make a minor physical assault charge stick, but there had been no proving beyond a reasonable doubt that the sex Hammond had had with Molly that night hadn't been consensual. That's how it goes sometimes with sexual assaults. The guy's lawyer throws everything he has at the idea that she might have wanted it. There was no physical evidence or witnesses to say otherwise. Well, now there was no evidence to say Ben Hammond wasn't bashed half to death by a mugger gone nuts, either. If he went to the cops about what I'd done, he'd know what it felt like not to be believed. But he wouldn't go to the cops and tell them a woman had given him a beatdown. His kind never did. I rolled my shoulders as I drove back across the city toward Potts Point, sighing long and low as the tension eased. I was really looking forward to getting some sleep. Most nights saw me at my local gym pounding boxing bags to try to exhaust myself into a healthy pre-sleep calm. Smacking Ben around had given me the same delicious fatigue in my muscles. I hoped it lasted. At the big intersection near King's Cross, a pair of hookers strutted across the road in front of my car. Their skin was lit pink by the huge neon Coca-Cola sign on the corner. The streets were still damp from a big storm the night before. The gutters were crowded with trash and huge fig tree leaves. My phone rang. I recognized the number as my station chief. Hello, Pops, I said. Hello? Take down this address, the old man said. There's a body I want you to look at. Chapter 5 Murder was hard work, but Hope had never been afraid of that. She knelt on the floor of the kitchen of the dream catcher and scrubbed at the polished boards. She was trying to push her brush down the cracks and bring up the blood that had dried and settled there. Deck, she thought suddenly, 
dunking the brush in the bucket of hot water and bleach beside her. On yachts, the floor was not a floor at all, but a deck. The kitchen was called a galley. She smiled. She'd need to get used to all the terminology. There was so much to learn, being a new boat owner. She sat back on her heels and wiped the sweat from her brow. She'd give the blood a rest for a while and work on the bedroom. The young woman climbed backward down the little ladder and walked into the yacht's expansive bedroom, gathering up a garbage bag from the roll she'd placed on the bed. The first thing she did was take a framed photograph from the nightstand and dump it in the darkness of the bag. She didn't look at the couple's smiling faces. She threw in some reading glasses, a pair of slippers, and a folded newspaper. She opened the cupboard and started taking out the woman's clothes, grabbing great handfuls on coat hangers and bundling the shirts, skirts, and pants into a roll before she shoved them into the bag. Jenny Spelling had awful taste, Hope thought, glancing at a turquoise skirt suit before it went into the trash. Ugh, shoulder pads. So 80s. She felt a wave of excitement roll over her as she looked along the empty hanging rod, thinking about her own clothes racked there. When she'd filled all the garbage bags on the rolls with their possessions, Hope walked to the back of the boat to check on her prisoners. The couple was slumped in the corner of the shower cubicle, Jenny's head twisted back against the wall so that her nose pointed upward and her mouth hung open. When Hope opened the door, Ken shifted up as much as his hands would allow. His wife was limp against him. I'm just heading out to get rid of some garbage, Hope said brightly. You guys need anything before I go? More water? Jenny Spelling woke and immediately started shivering. She stared at Hope wordlessly, as though she didn't know what the young woman was. Hope! Ken's face reddened with desperation. I'm begging you, please. Just take the boat. Take everything. My wife needs to do her dialysis. Or she's going to die, okay? It's only going to take a few minutes. That's all. That We've discussed this. Hope held up her hand, gave him a weary sigh. It'll all be over soon. I'm not getting into this again. The last time I let you loose, you did this. She held up her forearm, showed in the bruise. Trust, Ken. You had it, and you lost it. Please, please, Ken shifted. Y you don't need to do this. Look at her, look at her face. She's missed her dialysis for three days now. She's not right, she's... Hope took the duct tape from the counter beside the toilet and ripped off a length. She placed a strip over Jenny's mouth, but gave Ken a few turns around his head. He was the feisty one. She worked emotionlessly as the tape sealed off his words. She, she's gonna die! The man howled through the tape. Please! Chapter 6 Heading to the crime scene, I drove through the quiet streets of Picnic Point and up through the National Park. The dark hills were spotted here and there with the gold porch lights of suburban mansions. I'd spent some time out here as a preteen with one of the foster families who had taken on my brother Sam and me. That is, before their adoption dream had ended. There had been so many young families who'd attempted to integrate us that it was difficult to decide which one it had been. All I remembered was the local school and the crowds of teens in green and gold uniforms, the curious glances we'd received as we entered midway through the semester. As usual, Sam and I had only been at the school for a few weeks. As a pair of kids who'd been in the system since we were practically toddlers, we didn't make life easy for our foster parents with our bad behavior. It was probably me who had broken the spell by running away in the middle of the night. Or maybe it was Sam setting something on fire, or running his mouth at our potential new parents. We'd both been equally bad at school, fighting off kids who wanted to give us grief, trying to show our new teachers who was really boss. Once our new mommies and daddies realized we weren't grateful for being saved, the fantasy usually died, 
In truth, Sam and I had always preferred the group homes and institutions they shipped us to between potential adopters. More places to hide. I dreamed as I drove by the lamplit houses of what it might have been like to grow up here, if I'd been a more stable kid. The police tape started at the edge of the main road. I was stopped by a young officer in a raincoat and flashed in my badge, only then realizing that my knuckles were still wrapped. Okay, Detective Blue, head down to the end of this road where it turns to dirt and go left along the river. You'll see the lights, the cop said. The river? Shit. I felt the fine hairs on my arms stand on end. Who's the victim? The cop waved me on. Another car was coming up behind me. I stood on the gas and zipped down the slope, almost swerving on the corner where the dirt began. I couldn't wait to get to the crime scene. If the victim was a young woman, it meant the George's River killer had struck again. And I was going to get him this time. Chapter 7 I parked close, unwrapped my knuckles, and strode up to the crime scene with my heart pumping in my ears. I didn't even bring my scene kit. I had to know as much as I could as fast as possible so that I could get Pops to put me on the case. The George's River killings were splashed all over the newspapers, and so were the idiots who had control of the case, a group of loudish guys from Sydney Metro Homicide who wouldn't give me so much as a whiff of what they had. I didn't want the notoriety these cops seemed to enjoy so much. I wanted to be involved in catching what was probably the most savage serial killer in our nation's history. Young, beautiful university students were going missing from the hip urban suburbs around the University of Sydney campus. Their savaged bodies were turning up on the banks of the Georges River, three or four days after they disappeared. My brother spent two days of his working week teaching undergrad design students at the university and lived in their midst in the hip suburbs around Newtown and Broadway. I'd talked to Sam about it a lot, about how the girls in his apartment building were terrified, begging the landlord to put cameras up outside the block, walking each other to and from their cars in the late hours. It might have been arrogant or naive, but I felt as if there was something I could contribute. Though my conviction rate in sex crimes wasn't good, that was part of the culture of the court system. I was a good cop, and I could practically smell the George's River killer haunting the women of my city. When the police came knocking on that evil prick's door, I wanted to be right there to see his face. The first thing I noticed that was wrong with the scene was the edge of the police tape. It was far too crowded. Half the officers who should have been in the inner cordon were standing at the outer cordon talking and smoking in the dark. I recognized a photographer from my station loitering uselessly by the lights rigged up over the scene. A fingerprint specialist was sitting under a tree eating a burrito out of a paper roll. What the hell was everyone doing? I ducked under the tape and came up beside the only officer in the crime scene. He was crouched over the body. When he turned around, I saw that the man by the body was Tate Barnes the walking embodiment of career suicide. Chapter 8 The effect of seeing Tate Barnes right in the middle of what I already considered my crime scene was like being maced. My eyes stung and my throat closed with panic. I'd never met the man before, but I knew the shaggy blonde hair and the leather jacket from stories I'd heard. There were hundreds of variations on the story of Tate Barnes. It was a terrible tale about a crime the man had committed that he'd tried to hide from the bosses during his academy application. It was said that, as a child, Tate and a group of his friends had murdered a mother and her young son. I turned away and grabbed at my face, tried to suppress a groan. I needed this guy out of my crime scene now. He straightened and offered me his hand. I'm Tox Barnes, he rasped. It sounded as though his throat was lined with sandpaper. Y you actually introduce yourself as Tox. I find it minimizes confusion. I'd heard the nickname, 
but I hadn't expected him to embrace it. Officers called Barnes toxic because any officer who agreed to work with him was essentially committing themselves to a lifetime of punishment from their fellow officers. General consensus was that Tox Barnes should never have been allowed into the force. Those who had worked with him were harassed relentlessly by their peers. He was the fox in the hen house. Aligning yourself with him meant you were on the side of a predator. I'd heard that there was nothing the administration had been able to do to stop Barnes from being a cop. He'd aced his application, and he'd committed the murder so young that his record had been expunged. But that didn't mean the rest of the force was going to sit by and let a murderer operate in their midst. He was the enemy, and if you joined him, you were the enemy too. Listen, Tox, I'm Detective Harriet Blue. I shook his rough hand half-heartedly. I'm going to need you to clear out of this scene. Chief Morris has put me on it. Mwah, Tox said, and returned to crouching. I waited, but nothing further came so I bent down beside him and glanced at the body. Sorry, uh, I didn't catch that. I said, meh, Tox replied. It was a dismissive noise. I was so shocked, so furious, I hadn't even taken in the sight of the girl on the sand before us. My eyes flicked over her naked chest, unseeing, as I tried to get my mind around the reality of the situation. She looked mid-twenties, Beautiful, dark-haired. She was wearing only a pair of panties. She was a George's River girl. I knew it. I needed to get this parasite of a man off my case. You don't understand, I said. This is my crime scene. This is my case, and I don't work with partners. Neither do I, he said, as if it were a matter of choice. Right, I sighed. So you can give me a brief on what you've observed, and then I need you to beat it and take your dismissive noises with you. Talk seemed to smirk in the dark as he stood and walked around the back of the body. I couldn't tell if he'd heard me or not. At the edge of the police tape, twenty yards away, my fellow officers were watching carefully to see if I'd cooperate with their nemesis, thereby giving them permission to make my life a living hell. I noticed some journalists among the crowd. The uniformed patrol officers securing the scene were so interested in Tox and me that they weren't even pushing them back. When I turned around, I saw that Tox had a pocket knife. He flicked open the blade with a snap and slashed at the girl. Chapter 9 What the? I stood up, tried to shield what Tox was doing from the press, who'd started snapping pictures. What the fuck are you doing? Tox didn't answer. He flipped the girl onto her front and pulled the underpants he'd slashed from her hips off her body. I watched in horror as he poked at the corpse's backside with the butt of the blade. He leaned in close and examined the surface of her skin. Someone at the edge of the crowd sneered. Sicko, somebody said. Someone say something! Nah, man, leave him. Let him mess up all the evidence. Detective... Barnes, I said. I'm ordering you to stop what you're doing right now. Tox put both his hands on the corpse's back and pushed down hard, just once. He pulled the hair away from the girl's face and stuck his third finger between her lips, pushed it deep inside her throat. The dead girl's cheeks puckered obscenely to allow his finger to push down. He extracted the finger and looked at the tip in the torchlight, grunted thoughtfully. I watched him take the girl's wrist and give it an exploratory wiggle before he stood up and dusted off his palms. Hmm, he said, and strode away from me toward the riverbank. I followed, grateful to be out of earshot of the vile things the cops at the tape were saying about him. I caught him at the water's edge and shoved him hard in the back. He stumbled in the sand. What was that for? he said in his strange, whispery voice. Jesus, I don't know, for violating the corpse of a young woman in front of all the nation's leading newspapers and half the police force? I snarled. What is wrong with you, man? I wasn't violating the corpse. 
I was testing a theory. He looked toward the mouth of the river. The kids who found the body said they thought they recognized the girl from a party last night, a few streets back from the river. I wanted to find out if that was bullshit before we go off interviewing all the morons who attended the party. She wasn't there, so we can forget that. I felt as if I were dreaming. This man seemed to have no idea how inappropriate his handling of the body had been. He was looking off toward the river and talking to himself as though I wasn't standing there. Of course she wasn't at the party, I said. Are you that stupid? She's a George's River girl. Right river, right age, right placement of the body. I could have told you that before you stuck your finger in her mouth. Are you that stupid? Tox looked at me finally. She's not one of the George's River killer's victims. No, she didn't die anywhere near here. You're insane. I waved him away and turned back to the crime scene. You don't touch a body until forensics is done with it. That's the first thing they teach you on the first day of forensics. You just... <laughs> You've compromised the case. I could hardly speak I was so mad. His passive stare made it worse. Forensics won't find anything, he said. She's been in the water for hours. I'm not listening to you. I like my job too much. Eh, he said. If you liked your job so much, you wouldn't insist on doing it wrong. Fuck you. She wasn't killed here. She was killed out at sea. She came here in the storm. I stopped walking and stared at him. He stuffed his hands into the pockets of his jacket and looked back with the ease and calm of a madman. Bullshit. Nope, he said. She's got mottled liver mortis on her ass and pulmonary edema in her lungs. He waited, but I wasn't going to give him the satisfaction of asking him to explain how he'd come up with that. He walked toward me and stood over me, as most men do. Liver mortis, he said. The settling and pooling of blood in the veins after de- I know what liver mortis is, asshole. Well, you'll know that if a corpse is being tossed around in rough water, the blood doesn't settle, so it never collects, he said. Except in the ass. Fine skin, lots of big juicy fat cells. I'd say she's been in the water at least twenty hours. With the storm blowing a westerly, she was likely dumped out there, in the ocean. The rigor mortis not set? No. And the pulmonary edema, I said, feeling my hackles rise again. The foam in her lu- I know what pulmonary edema is, asshole, Tox said. She was alive when she went in, I whispered. Chapter 10 I followed Tox back to the body of the girl and stood facing away from the crowd. My mind was swirling. Sure, Tox knew his stuff. He'd already started developing a theory, helping my case enormously within only minutes of the scene being cordoned off. But as I glanced at the cops behind me, I knew I couldn't keep him around much longer, or I'd never get the thing solved. Working with Tox Barnes wouldn't throw a wrench into the works. It'd throw a whole toolbox. As far as I'd heard, people now and then were forced to work with him. But he was a burden that one took heavily, and offloaded as soon as possible. You found a way to transfer out of partnership with him. Or soon enough, you would begin to find your job almost impossible. People started avoiding you in the coffee room, losing your reports, delaying your lab results. Accidents would begin to happen. Someone would spill coffee on your laptop, bump your car on the way out of the parking lot, forget to include you in weekend get-togethers. I just turned to him to ask him again to leave when I noticed he was smoking a cigarette. Jesus Christ, I said, put that out. You're in my crime scene, he grunted. You've just had that hand in a dead girl. That was this hand. He lifted the other from his pocket, waved it, 
pulled the cigarette from his mouth with the clean one. For a detective, you're pretty blind to details. Me? I've noticed everything there is to notice about your hands. Chewed nails, swollen knuckles. No sign of a wedding ring, probably ever. Look, I leaned close. I don't like you. I don't want to work with you. I've heard bad things, and they appear to be true. You should have waited for an autopsy to confirm your findings. There's a process, and it's in place for a reason. I don't like to waste time, he said. And that's exactly what you're doing now, jibber-jabbering at me. What station you work at? Surrey Hills, I said. Right. He clapped me hard on the shoulder as he turned to leave. I'll see you there first thing. He wandered off, and the police officers lining the tape watched him go. When he was a good distance away, they ducked under the tape and started getting up to do their jobs. I stood stunned in their midst. No idea what I should do next. The photographer snapped a picture of me standing over the body, my arms folded. That guy's a murderer, you know, he said, adjusting his lens. Killed a mother and her young kid. Beat him to death. Tox was seven. Yeah, so I hear. I was badly craving a cigarette of my own now. I hadn't smoked in years, but no one around me was offering anything but hateful glances. Guy like that's gonna do it again, the photographer said. You don't start that young unless it's in your bones. Chapter 11 My head was a mess by the time I arrived at Surrey Hills Police Headquarters. It was 6 a.m. and the sun was rising. I'd stayed at the crime scene and orchestrated the evidence collection, got rid of the press, and sent out a couple of detectives to bring the parents in. Within an hour, we had preliminary identification. Until we could get the parents to ID the body, we weren't sure. But it looked as though the girl was Claudia Burroughs. Her description linked up with a missing persons report that had been issued a day earlier. She had a tattoo of a rabbit in a waistcoat on her hip that matched the report exactly. I didn't like where this was all going, mainly because it was heading in the very opposite direction of the George's River killer. The killer we'd been hunting didn't drown his victims. He didn't put them in the water at all, but left them stripped to their panties face down on the beach. His victims showed signs of physical and sexual abuse, while Claudia hadn't looked in any way battered. I checked her wrists and ankles for ligature marks, but there were none, except for a rough sort of rubbing on one foot. For all I knew, she might have fallen into Botany Bay, drunk and drowned there, the waves stripping her clothes off as she floated toward the mouth of the river. Though it didn't look good for my entry onto the Georgia's River Killer Task Force, I wasn't going to let go. It was possible the killer had changed his methods to confuse us. He was a wily creature, as far as I could tell, and he might have recognized that he was being tracked. I went right to the door of the task force's case room and knocked, trying to shove my way in when no one answered. I came up against the thin and wiry Detective Nigel Spader, just inside the door. You're not allowed in here. He pushed me back out the door before I could get a glimpse of their case board. This is the last time I'm going to tell you, Blue. I'm allowed in, I said. Chief Morris put me on a George's River body last night. You'll need to debrief me and get me up to speed so we can start making connections. Your case is not connected to ours. He tried to shut the door on me. How the fuck would you know something like that? It's a dark-haired girl almost naked on the banks of the Georges. I'm ticking all the boxes. If I knew what other boxes I could tick, maybe the link would be even stronger. You're putting me on this task force, Nigel, before I kick you in the face. It's not the GRK, Nigel sighed. Now piss off. He slammed the door on my boot. I shoved forward, slid an arm into the gap, and tried to grab him. Pop's voice sent a bolt of electricity through me. Detective Blue? I I'm just helping, Chief. I pulled the door shut, gave the knob a jiggle making sure the case room is secure. You got the dead girl's parents in interrogation room six. He carried his coffee toward me. 
I put the paperwork in. You'll share the case with Detective Barnes. Are you kidding me? He was the first responder, the old man said. He's got some good theories. The media has got hold of the case already, so it'll be all over the news. And she's a bright, pretty university student. I want to have something meaningful to say at the press conference. University student? My mouth fell open. She just applied and been accepted. Her parents told the patrol cops who picked them up, the chief said. Applied, studied. In the media's eyes, it's the same thing. She was full of prospects. We need to get something quickly. Well, you can tell them this is a George's River killer case, then. I counted off on my fingers. Dark hair, George's River, semi-naked, university student. It's not, Pop said, and walked away. I stood in the middle of the bullpen and looked at the officers all around me, some of them answering phones, some of them clicking away at computers. Had the whole world gone crazy? I felt as if I were speaking a foreign language, and everyone I talked to was pretending to understand and then brushing me off. I was concerned I was getting so frustrated I might be tempted to cry. I generally cry about once a year, so I wasn't going to waste it on this bureaucratic bullshit. This is a George's River Killer case, I roared. The men and women on their phones turned to look at me. I need to be on the task force. It's not, Pop said calmly as he closed the door to his office. Chapter 12 The dream catcher had been in a dry dock at Garden Island for two days. In that time, Hope had cleared it of almost all the spelling's possessions. She did keep some things, a nice new laptop that had belonged to Ken, and some of Jenny's more modern jewelry. She was exhausted from constant trips to the shower cubicle to see if Ken was awake, and, if he was, to hold the chloroform-soaked rag over his face until he slept again. Jenny didn't stir at all. It was as though she knew her husband was lost in the land of dreams, and she'd chosen to join him there. Between trips to check on her prisoners, Hope spent most of that morning lying on the bow, in one of the deck chairs in her bikini, reading the yacht's operating manual and writing down questions for Ken. She needed a tan if she was going to fit in with the other yachties. She couldn't look like a newbie, or they wouldn't accept her into their world. Sometimes she closed her eyes and pretended she was at sea, sailing across the Indian Ocean, the sun baking her pale skin a deep golden brown, like Jenny's. She didn't keep her eyes closed too long, or she'd see flashes, electric zings of light that sometimes contained frightened faces, splashes of blood, clawing fingers. The images played about the corners of her eyes, made her chew her nails. They'd go in time, these memories. She just had to focus on the plan. It was almost funny the way it had all come together one night at the Black Garter while she'd been sitting in the window watching the men outside. One of the girls had wandered in from the main hall with a sea captain's hat on her head, tipping the brim in the closet mirror and tilting her naked hips. She'd snagged the hat from the leader of a bachelor party, the pack of drunken boys hollering from the back courtyard as other girls danced around the lazy-eyed groom. What do you think? The girl had taken the cap off and sent it sailing across the room into Hope's hands like a frisbee. Captain Hope reporting for duty. Hope had stared at herself in the mirror after the girl had gone, the cap too big on her head, a tiny girl playing dress-up, She'd remembered sailing with her father, those few times he had indulged himself over the years, and rented cruisers for a trot around the harbor, pretending he owned them. Lies and make-believe. Hope was so tired of all the games, the ones the men made her play, the ones she played with herself. Captain Hope, master of her own destiny. It would take a miracle to achieve something like that, she'd thought. Or would it? What exactly would it take? 
Hope walked the length of the vessel now, examining the newly painted surface, and then climbed down the ladder onto the floor of the dry dock. When she'd acquired the dream catcher, it had been a hideous wine bottle green, but the guy she'd hired for the makeover had finished the last coat of the new color, a chic modern ash gray. Hope had started making lists of steps in her plan that very night as she'd huddled away in the back of the brothel, and once the list had been completed, she'd made a new one. She couldn't remember how many lists it had taken, how many crossed or canceled steps. Find a couple selling their yacht. Find an ally to comfort the couple as they inquired about the sale. Someone cute and easy to manipulate. Someone who knew how to act in a prescribed role. Hope had followed a recipe she found online for chloroform and cooked it in the brothel kitchen, whistling, as if she were baking a cake. Picking out and commissioning the fresh paint job on the boat was one step she'd been looking forward to for a while. She stood now with her hand on the vessel and listened to the hull to see if there was any sign of the couple from within. Nothing. She wandered around the back of the boat in her sun hat and glasses and stood watching the men on the ladder as they applied the new name to the side. Just in time for the big reveal, the tall one said. He was a stunning young man in a cut-off undershirt, spattered all over with tiny spots of white paint. He looked as if he were covered in stars. He reached up and began peeling away the paper stencil around the lettering on the hull of the boat. The new hope, she read. She felt a dark stirring in her chest at the sight of the words. She'd had the boys paint them in a deep crimson. Her dream, written in blood. Chapter 13 Tox was already in the interrogation room with Claudia's parents. Not only was it one of the unfriendliest rooms in the station to speak to them, but I had no idea what he'd already said. I felt my stomach tighten as I spotted him sitting there in the cramped, musty room beyond the two-way mirror, their horrified faces. Mom and Dad had recently been crying. She was a heavy blonde woman, and their daughter's lean features and dark hair came from her mustached father. I threw open the door just in time. Breast implants, Tox was saying. What? Mrs. Burroughs frowned. She glanced at me, her mouth twisted. Yeah, what? I sat down beside Tox. I was just asking Mr. and Mrs. Burroughs here how long it had been since their daughter got those breast implants. He looked lazily at me. You did notice the cadaver had breast implants, right? Mr. and Mrs. Burroughs, I put my hands calmly on the table beside the handcuff hooks. I must apologize for my partner here. Detective Barnes has been under a lot of stress and isn't thinking clearly. Tox folded his hands on the table beside mine, imitating me. Look, your daughter was found deceased this morning, and that's very sad. But I'm sure that you'll get over that sadness and want to catch whoever did this, eventually. Well, you know what? We want to catch whoever did this now. It's our job, see? Now your daughter had fake tits. Tox! I yelped. And I'm putting together the exaggerated size of those tits and her petite figure, and the approximate cost of such a surgical enhancement, and your obvious middle-classness. I'm going to take a leap and say she was a prostitute. Jesus! I clapped a hand over my eyes. Actually, it's not a leap at all, Tox confirmed. She was a prostitute, wasn't she? The Burroughses sat stunned. I got up and grabbed Tox's arm and yanked him toward the door. I'll be back, I told the couple. Just sit tight. Tox turned on me in the hallway. What is it with you and wasting time? He grunted, almost irritated. I was on a roll in there. You were not on a roll, I snapped. You were on anything but a roll. You were traumatizing the dead girl's parents. Jesus Christ, 
Tox threw his hands up, flapped them dramatically, trying to imitate my voice with his gravelly tones. You're sticking your finger in the dead girl. You're smoking near the dead girl. You're traumatizing the parents of the dead girl. You sure you're right for this job, detective? You might find yourself better employed in undertaking. You're in love with the dead girl. You just... You can't talk to people this way. I was so horrified the words wouldn't come. These parents are grieving. No, they're probably not even grieving yet. They're probably still in shock. Is the emotional state of these people really your priority right now? Tox shook his head in disbelief. First, you want me to slow down so that we can go through all the procedural bullshit surrounding the corpse. Now, you want me to slow down so we can go through all the emotional crap with the parents. Do you actually want to solve this case, or are you just trying to score overtime? It's not crap. It's, it's life. Not my life, Tox snorted. A pair of patrol cops were walking down the hall toward us, carrying folders full of papers. One bumped hard into my shoulder as she passed, causing me to drop my phone. My punishment had begun. Nearby, an older officer I knew, Chris Murray, was fielding a call and glaring at us, taking in the figure of my new partner with obvious distaste. Um, how long has the couple been missing? Murray was saying into his mobile. And what's the name of the boat? Listen, I pointed at Tox. If we're going to work together on this, there need to be rules. I think number one should be that I do all the talking all the time. Yeah, he grunted. Sounds just like a woman. All the talking all the time. He went back into the interrogation room. I held my face in my hands for a long moment, relishing the darkness. When I lifted my head, there were about five people in the bullpen staring at me, each set of eyes more hateful than the last. Chapter 14 I called my brother Sam from the ladies' bathroom, leaning my forehead on the mirror. I knew that he'd probably be teaching his classes at the university, but I dialed anyway. What's up? he answered. I'm in crisis mode, I said. I need a friendly voice. I explained the situation in a long, rambling stream. In the background of the call, I could hear students rumbling through the halls of the university. Being partnered up with this guy, is it going to make solving the case difficult? The case should be fine, but my social standing might take a hit. He laughed. I'd never had many friends to begin with, and he knew that. I was a loner, hardly a cheerful spirit. I forgot people's birthdays and didn't turn up to work drinks. None of my colleagues tried to set me up on dates. They knew a romantic train wreck when they saw one. If I stick with them too long, I might have to start chewing my lunch more carefully, I continued. Cops, Sam said. All that ancient brotherhood bullshit. I can see where everyone's coming from, I sighed. I mean... Apart from what he's supposed to have done, the guy is also a world-class arrogant dickhead. I told Sam about his treatment of Claudia's body, about how he'd spoken to her parents. He might just be out of practice on his behavior with other people. If he's such an outcast, he might have genuinely forgotten how people are supposed to talk to each other, Sam suggested. You always think the best of people, I said. I don't know how. I'm about ready to kill him. Well, that might make things messier. You may be the only man I'm not prepared to strangle right now, I told him. That detective Nigel Spader caught me at the door to the case room. I didn't even get a peek. Ah, yes, I've met that one. He was here yesterday doing interviews of the faculty, trying to find out if we know anything about the Georges River girls, Sam said. I think we're booked in for second interviews today. Two of the victims were students here. Second interviews? A couple of us, yeah, he said. I don't know why. Weird. Were the victim students of yours? No, he sighed. 
but some of my students were friends with them. A girl rushed out of my morning class yesterday crying. It's hard to know what to say. My stomach felt mildly unsettled. I put the phone on speaker and washed my face under the tap. Tell me how the second interview goes, I told Sam. I convinced myself it was just the stress of the new case and my new partner making me sick. If I kept on track, it would go away. As I'd find often in my life, I should have listened to what my instincts were telling me. Chapter 15 Top smoked in my car. As I drove, I tried to think of one thing about him that didn't annoy me. I decided I didn't mind Tox's leather jacket. I had a similar one. We stopped for coffee outside the station and then headed west toward Claudia Burroughs' apartment on Parramatta Road. When you arrived at the crime scene last night, I saw you unwrapping your knuckles in your car, Tox said, putting one of his boots on the dashboard. You box? I box, yes. Who'd you beat up? I didn't beat anyone up. Boxers spar. There's very little blood involved. Looked to me like you pounded on someone outside the ring, using your boxing skills to get the upper hand. See, this is what you do, I said. You make microscopic observations and you blow them out into wild theories that make no sense. Like the tits. Stop saying tits. Christ, you sound like a fat, sleazy truck driver in a highway bar. I imitated his quiet, gravelly voice, grabbed my crotch. Look at those tits. I love tits. Grrr. Was that supposed to be me? Yes. You want to know why I sound like this? He rasped. I glanced over and he pulled at the collar of his shirt, revealing a long pink scar at the base of his throat. Drug dealer stabbed me in the neck during a raid. Went right through the windpipe and out the other side. Well, I said, I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to make fun. He stared at me. What kind of a horrible person makes fun of someone with a physical disability? Shut up! I shoved him into the car door. God damn it! All right, so... Mom and Dad claimed Claudia was a part-time waitress, Tox said. She wasn't paying for those knockers on a waitress's salary. And even if she was, you don't get them that size unless you're in the sex industry. Maybe she got a loan, I said. And maybe she got them that size because she liked them that size. Look, I work in sex crimes, okay? So I'm going to need you to get your brain out of the dark ages and stop making misogynistic assumptions about our victim. Mm -hmm. He sat back and flicked his cigarette ash out the window. What does your girlfriend think about you working in sex crimes? My girlfriend? I looked at him. I'm not gay. Oh, right. What made you think I was gay? He waved his cigarette at my head. Your hair. We pulled into an old apartment block in Auburn and parked in the visitor space. I didn't talk to Tox on the way up the damp concrete steps. If he was going to make me this mad every time we spoke, I was going to have a brain aneurysm before we actually discovered what had happened to Claudia Burroughs. Tox's sexism wasn't helped by Nigel Spader and his team, rebuffing me from the George's River killer case. The Australian police force had always been full of boys' club antics, what Sam called the ancient brotherhood bullshit. I was disappointed to see it creeping into my own station. Pops was a good chief and didn't let even the most minor sexual harassment or favoritism play down between his staff. But I had the feeling Nigel and his boys didn't want me on the task force because I was a woman, and that even if Claudia did turn out to be one of the George's River victims, they'd take the case off me completely. This was going to be a history-making case. There would be books about it. Nigel wanted his face on one of those books. He oozed heroic smugness. Tox opened Claudia's door with the keys her parents had given us. He'd only prized it open a crack when it slammed back against him, and someone inside yelled, Go! Go! Chapter 16 
Hope analyzed her reflection in the jewelry shop window, pulling the wig down slightly at the front and straightening her skirt suit jacket. She kept only one of Jenny Spelling's suits in a hideous mustard yellow, the closest fit and the most modern piece she could find. It looked as though Jenny hadn't updated her wardrobe in decades. That irritated Hope. She couldn't stand people who'd been lucky enough to grow up in the lap of luxury, who then refused to use the money they'd squirreled away. She didn't know much about Jenny, but she couldn't understand how anyone respected her, dressed like this. She felt awkward in the slightly too big heels, like a child playing dress-up. Her first stop when she got the money was going to be shopping for herself and for the boat. The galley needed new curtains, and the bridge needed a lamp. Hope tried to contain the excitement bubbling up inside her, taking a deep breath before she walked into the bank. She went directly to the manager's desk and sat down on the chair there. A young man with a big Adam's apple came wandering out, his face spreading into a smile. How can I help you? Oh, hi, Hope extended a hand. I'm Jenny Spelling. I'd like to make a transaction from my savings account, please. Of course. The young man glanced toward the queue waiting at the counters. Is this a large transaction? I'd like to empty the account and close it, actually, Hope said. Nothing to do with your bank. You've been wonderful to my husband and I, but we're moving overseas and we'll be starting a local account there. Well, congratulations, the young man said. What an exciting time. Let me just get your identification, Mrs. Spelling, and we'll have a look for you. Hope opened Jenny Spelling's clunky leather wallet and extracted her driver's license and credit card. She kept a hand up near her eyes, playing with the edge of her low, heavy bangs, as the young man looked over the cards. It worked. He went to the computer beside him and started tapping. Hope could feel sweat running down the backs of her calves. She squirmed in the older woman's shoes, trying to keep a straight face. So it's your main savings account that you'd like to close. Or would you like to close your everyday account as well? Oh, all of it, she said. I'll take all of it, please. Chapter 17 Hope glanced at the screen and noted the amounts in the accounts. The everyday was petty cash, but the digits in the main savings account made her heart twist in her chest. So close to her dream. So close to everything she'd ever wanted. She needed to play it cool now. She touched her eyebrow as a muscle began to twitch there. Um, so it says here... The young man frowned and clicked. Says here this is actually a joint signature account. What? Hope choked. Right here. The young man turned the screen toward her, tapped its glossy surface. When you and your husband opened the account, you made a provision that you could only extract more than $1,000 from this account if you both came into the bank and signed for it. Fuck, Hope blurted. She covered her mouth. I mean, oh, dear. Um, you don't remember making that provision? The young man asked. Hope scratched at her throat. No, I don't. Where did you open the account? He turned the screen back toward himself while Hope shifted in her chair. Oh, God, it was such a long time ago, she laughed. Look, let me get a thousand dollars and I'll get Ken down here to empty the main savings with me some other time. Right. The young man was looking at her very closely now. Hope turned her face away, glanced at the people waiting in line at the counter. Would you like to empty the every day as well? That account is yours alone. I know that, Hope snapped. She shoved her hands into her lap. I'm sorry. Yes, I know that. I'll empty that account too. Mm-hmm. The young man made some movements with his mouse. While he clicked and scrolled, Hope watched his face until his eyes slid over and met hers. All right. Yep. Hope smiled. All right. The young man got up and gave a cheerful smile. I'll be back in just a minute. 
Hope could hardly wait for him to count out the bills. She grabbed the money and her cards from the desktop and practically ran to the door. In the street, she paused and looked at the men and women passing by, their eyes on their phones. She'd hoped no one else would have to die for her plan to be completed. But something inside told her that more blood would be needed to wash away the life she was trapped in. Chapter 18 I got out my gun and kicked in the door of Claudia's apartment, slamming it against the guy who just closed it on us. He fell into a coffee table covered in beer bottles, scattering them everywhere. There was another guy at the entrance to the kitchen. I pulled my gun up and shouted, but he ran in there, hoping for an exit. There was none. Tox grabbed the first guy, picked him up off the ruined coffee table, and threw him into the television stand, crunching DVD boxes and splintering the screen of the cheap plasma. I went to the kitchen doorway and was narrowly missed by a flying frying pan. Two saucepans and a handful of cutlery came sailing out after it. I put my gun away and grabbed the frying pan from the couch where it had landed. When I rushed into the kitchen, the guy cowered into the corner near the blender as I wielded the pan above my head. How do you like it? I yelled. His arm was raised against the weapon, eyes squeezed shut. Don't! Please! I'm sorry! I let him up. Shit, man! You want crazy bitch! Get out there! I yanked him toward the door. Tox had the other guy on the floor beside the glass heap that had been the coffee table. Bright red blood was pouring down Tox's chin and neck, making a neat column on his chest. Little prick kicked me in the face. Tox looked at the blood on his hand. What are you dickheads doing here? I kicked my guy along the floor until he was beside his friend. You know Claudia Burroughs is dead, right? We heard about it. My guy was holding his head of black dreadlocks, his eyes welling with tears of panic. She borrowed some money from our boss three weeks ago. We were told to come get it before the police swept in and took everything. The intruders had gathered a small pile of cash and electronic goods and put them on the couch, with some jewelry clumped into a Chinese takeaway container. How much did she borrow? Tox asked. Not much, five grand. It was a short-term loan. She said she was coming into some big money and said she'd get it right back to us. Shh, dude. Tox's guy nudged his friend. Fuck, man, who are you talking to? Pfft, they don't care. Dreadlocks waved dismissively at me. They just care who killed her. How did you hear she'd been killed? Her body was only found last night. My brother's a patrol cop in Newtown, Dreadlocks waved again. Your brother's a cop and you're a loan shark's bitch? I snorted. No guessing who got all the hugs. What did Claudia borrow the money for? Tox asked. Did she say? We're not talking anymore. That's it. We're done. All right. Well... It's down to the station with both of you for breaking and entering. I took the cuffs off the back of my belt and maybe assaulting a police officer. She needed clothes, Dreadlocks wailed as I dragged him up and threw him on the couch. Good girl clothes. What do you mean, good girl clothes? Shut up, Ray, fuck. I cuffed Ray and left him moaning in regret on the couch, his face pressed between the pillows. In the bedroom, Claudia's things had been thrown about, drawers emptied onto the bed, and her jewelry tipped onto the floor. I went to the closet and pushed open the doors, and immediately I could see what Ray meant. Claudia's clothes were scant, tiny tops and tight leggings, plenty of sequins and beads, and the odd strip of gold leather. I pulled out a complicated black corset of velvet, the buckles jangling as I set it on the bed. At the very end of the closet, there were three new outfits hanging, long-sleeved silk blouses and pencil skirts in plastic sheaths. Beneath them on the carpet was a pair of brand-new sensible leather pumps. I checked the brands of the outfits, tugged a price tag that was still attached to one of them. Damn, these were certainly good girl clothes. Against the rest of her wardrobe, these outfits seemed like a disguise. 
I bent down as one of the jackets slid off the hanger and gathered it up from the floor, spotting a dusty white powder on the wrist. I gathered it up and tasted it, expecting cocaine, but I was surprised. It was dry salt, slightly fishy tasting. Sometime recently, Claudia had worn these clothes by the sea. Chapter 19 I needed coffee. All the calm and contentment I'd managed to generate last night by giving Ben Hammond a pounding was gone now. My shoulders were as hard as stone. We stopped at a cafe on the way back to the city, and Tox dragged out an ancient black laptop. Claudia's parents said nothing about her being a hooker. I rubbed my eyes. Maybe she was just dipping into the industry briefly to raise some money to go to college. So why borrow the five G's, then? Tox asked. Why spend them on conservative clothes? I don't know. But while we're on the subject of clothes, you'll need to change before we go much farther. The waitress was so distracted by the blood on the front of Tox's shirt that she hardly managed to get our order down. My new partner's eyes were steadily blackening, and there was a graze above his nasal bone. Tox glanced at his shirt. Eh, yeah, he said. You're going to go to college, I mused. Start fresh. Make something of your life. You're 24 years old, so you've left it late, but not that late. You've been accepted. What do you do? You go out and buy textbooks, Tox said. Right, textbooks. A laptop, maybe. Not expensive clothes. And where's this money coming from in the first place? The big money she says she's about to come into. An email came up on my phone and I checked it. It was a brief summary from the medical examiner, a quick review of his initial findings before the full autopsy on Claudia Burroughs. Tox had been right about the livor mortis and the pulmonary edema and the fact that Claudia had likely been dead a day, in the water about 20 hours. And he was also right about the breast implants. I saw him smiling at his laptop screen. He'd probably just gotten the same email. This is interesting, I said. She'd had her hair dyed and cut no more than a week ago, and she'd taken a good bonk to the back of the head. Feet are showing blisters from the new high heels, Tox added. So whatever she needed to jazz up her appearance for, she's done it in the last week or so. Parents didn't mention any job interviews. Weird. Our coffees came. I gulped mine and ordered another. Skin slippage around the right ankle suggests ligature, anti-mortem, for a short amount of time, pulling downward over the front of the foot toward the toes, I read. So she was weighed down when she went in the water? How do you figure that? Well, weight goes into the water. I drew a circle on the greasy tabletop with my finger, a line rising from it. Rope goes up from the weight, ties around Claudia's ankle. Claudia floats upward, pulling the rope down toward her toes. The rope doesn't bruise her too badly because it comes loose in the storm, letting her body float away. We fell into silence to consider the images before us, the cold medical text detailing Claudia's horrific last moments on Earth. This is a pretty nasty killer we have here, I said. I can't imagine why throwing her in alive was necessary. By the time you've got her tied to the weight, she's under your control. Why not put her out of her misery? Why make her think about the journey down to the bottom of the sea? It's so vicious. I don't know about that, Tox said. Think about it. Putting her out of her misery is extra effort, extra consideration. What we might have here is someone who isn't even that thoughtful. Someone who never thought about what the victim would or wouldn't feel. I think we're looking for a killer whose priority is getting the job done, ticking the boxes. Just my opinion. I pushed my phone away and studied his face as he checked through the rest of his emails. I couldn't help but feel an icy heaviness in my chest at his talk of priorities and getting the job done. He'd shown himself to be just that kind of man unconcerned with what people feel. I wondered if he was just talking about Claudia's victims, 
or his own ones, too. Chapter 20 My knuckles still hurt from the impact against the back of Ben Hammond's skull, but I wasn't focusing on that as I smacked my opponent in his ribs, his chest. I surged forward and drove an elbow into the side of his padded head. Pops backed up into the corner of the ring. I didn't think of him as the old squat man that he was. In the ring, we were equals. I gave him a couple of jabs in the face and backed off to let him out of the trap he'd fallen into. Mind that back step, the chief pointed at my foot with his red boxing glove. Don't cross. Pops had been training me since I'd arrived at Sydney Metro to take up the grand position of the only woman on the sex crime squad. There hadn't been a female in my role for five years, but the department had wanted someone victims could relate to, someone who wouldn't accidentally intimidate them with their masculine hulk in the tiny station interview rooms. It wasn't long after arriving that I decided I needed some form of self-defense. My days filled with horrific stories of attacks in alleyways and empty parking lots, young girls ensnared walking home across darkened parks by fiendish predators. I was probably getting too swift for Chief Morris, who had been training boxers since before I was born. But I trusted his advice. He'd made me strong, and he didn't take less than full commitment in his sessions. Tell me about the George's River case, I said, batting away his swing at my face. Why were your guys so sure my girl wasn't one of the victims? I'd given up on the idea that Claudia Burroughs was a George's River killer victim but something was nibbling at me about the certainty with which Nigel had shoved me away. Nigel hadn't even been called to Claudia's crime scene for a look. How could they know their killer wasn't responsible? Have you guys got a suspect? I asked. Leave it, Harry, he said. You must be pretty set on this suspect if you're certain he didn't kill Claudia, I said. Maybe because you were watching your suspect when Claudia was killed. Am I right? Have you got enough for an arrest? I didn't even say we had a suspect. Well, if you don't have a suspect, I have to assume you're letting Nigel and his band of asshats push me away because they want it to be a men-only case. I punched Pops in the stomach. He fell against the ropes. Harry! I'm a good cop, you know. I thumped my chest with my boxing glove. Being a woman shouldn't exclude me from anything. No one's excluding you. The Camden Strangler? Dennis Yama? David Paris, that cannibal guy? They were all me, Pops. Homicide got the credit, sure, but it was the sex crime side of those investigations that put them on track. Harry, no one's doubting your abilities. Then why the fuck am I being shut out? I pummeled Pops with a series of hits to the head. Without warning... He clutched at his chest and fell onto the corner of the ring. I watched in horror as he collapsed. Chapter 21 Oh, shit! I tore my gloves off. Shit! Pops! I'm, I'm sorry! I dragged the old man to his feet. He unclipped the padded helmet and let it fall to the mat. His face was red and drenched in sweat. He thumped his chest as though he had heartburn and shook his head. Are you all right? Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry, I, I got carried away. You're too good for your old trainer, Harry. He batted me on the shoulder with his glove. You're a good cop, too. You're not being shut out of the Georges River Task Force because of your abilities or your gender. You gotta let it go, okay? Why? I followed the old man to the stool at the opposite corner of the ring. I handed him the bottle of water sitting there. I just don't understand. I, I feel like there's something you're keeping from me. And we've never been like this, Pops. We've never kept things from each other. The old man sucked at the water bottle and regained his breath. He wouldn't meet my eyes. I ducked my head to try to see what was hidden there, whether it was guilt or shame or concern cutting him off from me but he wiped his forehead on the back of his arm and turned away. It'll all come out in time, he said. And when it does, 
<clears throat> you'll, you'll be grateful for all the time you didn't know the truth. Chapter 22 Hope needed to stay calm. It was rational planning and control that was going to get her through this. As soon as she had the spelling's money, she was out of here. Off toward the sunrise on the gentle waves. She'd never look back on Sydney, on the feast of horrors the city had provided over her life. This town deserved to burn. She walked along the pier between the yachts and looked at the glowing city towers reflected in the black harbor. Soon she'd be underway. Her plan was to leave behind the memories of what she had done to Jenny and Ken Spelling, along with the memories of her father and his sweaty, grabby hands. She'd try to replace the night beast he'd become after her mother's death with the man she remembered from her early childhood. His eyes set on the horizon, one warm hand on hers, as he taught her to direct the helm, taking them out toward the edge of forever. She'd leave them behind with the memories of her almost skeletal mother, curled up in the tub she died in, with the smoke-saturated bedrooms of the Black Garter Hotel, where she'd worked for almost all of her adult life. If she closed her eyes, she could still see the red lamplight out of the front of the House of Horrors, the men smoking there, looking at their phones, talking about the girls inside and which ones provided which services. Soon, when she closed her eyes, it would be the Caribbean sun burning red light there. Or maybe Key Largo. She hadn't decided yet. As she powered the New Hope east out over the South Pacific, she jettisoned the images that sometimes zapped through her. Claudia's howling mouth as she'd sailed downward into the blackness of the ocean, the anchor yanking her soundlessly into the dark. Her confused eyes as Hope had come into the kitchen after they'd secured the spellings in the bathroom, the hammer in her fist. I thought we were in this together. Her squeal of disbelief as Hope had raised the hammer above her head. Chapter 23 Hope still carried the hammer with her in Jenny's cream Louis Vuitton handbag. She supposed she'd have to get rid of that, too. She was dreaming as she wandered along mooring number 17 and almost ran into the overweight man with the clipboard standing there. Oh, sorry. <laughs> it's all right, he laughed. His name tag said Steve. Is this your yacht here? Yes, it is, actually, Hope smiled. It's just come out of dry dock. I signed in at the office. Yes, yes, that's all good, Steve glanced at his clipboard. I'm actually just doing a safety inspection. The Coast Guard makes us do spot checks now and then on all the moorings. Uh-huh, Hope chewed her lip. She listened to the boat beside them. Was that thumping she could hear? Could Steve hear it too? Everything's fine. It's just, it's so weird. Steve pointed with his pen to a red cone-shaped device strapped to the side of the deck. I'm running checks on all the EPIRBs to make sure they're registered and up-to-date, and this one isn't right. Hope shifted her handbag on her shoulder. An EPIRB? It's an emergency position indicating radio beacon. Steve looked at the sky, recited the words carefully. Ha! That's what I think it stands for anyway. That beacon gets wet? and it'll send a signal to the Coast Guard telling them you're in trouble. You'll want to chuck it in the water long before you start to sink, though. Right, <laughs> Hope laughed. They also kind of act like a microchip would in your family dog, Steve said. They're registered to particular people and particular boats, in case the boat gets lost. Or the people get lost. <laughs> now, I'm seeing that your boat here is the New Hope. But when I look up your EPIRB number on the computer, it says this boat should be Dreamcatcher. Steve tipped his clipboard, which he used to balance a thin computer tablet. Hope hardly glanced at the numbers on the screen. Did you change your vessel's name, Ms... Steve looked at the screen. Ms. Spelling? Uh, no. Hope wiped sweat from her neck. No, this is, this is a different vessel. 
that we... we only recently purchased, my husband and I. Oh. I mean, I'm not even Ms. Spelling. Hope drew a long breath. Whoever that is, I'm, uh... Steve waited. Look, would you like to come aboard? Hope gestured to the yacht. Come on board and I'll show you the paperwork and we can sort all this out. Sure thing, Steve smiled. He turned and stepped across the small gangway to the deck. Hope followed, sliding her hand into the darkness of her handbag and around the polished handle of the hammer. Chapter 24 Despite the evening gym session, I couldn't sleep. I desperately needed to. I called my brother and blasted him with complaints about talks as soon as he picked up. What actually is the story with this guy? He said. How can he possibly be a cop if you're saying he's killed two people? No idea, I grunted. People are saying he was seven years old. If I had to guess, I'd say that because of his age at the time of the crime, he'd have been charged with involuntary manslaughter, if he was charged with anything at all. Apparently, it was a group of boys, not just him. So his lawyers would have said he was influenced by the group and far too young to know what he was doing. But you don't actually know any details about it. No, the records are sealed. I tried to have a look before I left work this afternoon. Sam scoffed. So it's all just rumor, really. What are you getting at? Maybe he didn't do it. If he didn't do it, he'd have set everyone straight, right? I said. The bosses would have set everyone straight. He must have done it. We fell silent. I'd like to think he didn't do it, I admitted. But when I look in his eyes, I'm not so sure. Chapter 25 I sat in bed all night on the computer after speaking to Sam, clicking around, looking for Claudia Burrows. She'd recently scrubbed her social media presence clean. There were suggestions that she'd once had a Facebook page and a Twitter account, but these were empty now, the links broken. I saw a couple of pictures of her on sites that must have belonged to her friends. She was a very different girl from the one whom I'd seen washed up on the shores of the George's River. Her hair, which had been short and dark when she died, was long and bleach blonde, the roots dark and the ends scraggly. I learned that she sometimes went under the name Claudia D. Did multiple names mean multiple identities? Was it Claudia D. who'd worn the skimpy clothes that filled most of her wardrobe, and Claudia Burrows who'd bought the more formal attire? I didn't like the idea that Claudia had been pretending to be someone else and that she'd recently told her creditors that she was coming into money. Had she been conducting a scam? If so, who was the victim? Had she been planning a robbery? I put the laptop away, discouraged by all the dead ends, and tried to sleep. Ten minutes later, I had it open again, doing different searches. At midnight, I called Chris Murray, the detective from the Surrey Hills Station. Do you have any idea what time it is? Murray, I said, you've got connections in the records department, don't you? I want you to help me out. I'm wandering aimlessly around the internet looking for anything I can get on Tox Barnes. Maybe they changed his name after the crime. Is that why I can't find any newspaper articles about him? The fact that you're carrying on working with that monster without looking for an out is exactly the reason I won't help you, he said. You should be trying to get away from him, not trying to understand him. I'm hanging up, Harry. Murray, don't go. I need help here, man. He murdered a woman and her kid, Murray said. He and a bunch of other kids stabbed them to death. I thought they beat them to death. Is how they did it very important? Hmm, I guess not. What exactly am I supposed to do, Murray? I've got a homicide on my hands. You know how often I get homicides and sex crimes? I can't just walk out on this. Feign sickness and leave the case to him, he said. He's good at what he does. He'll solve it himself in no time. Probably uses his killer instincts. 
this is what people do? I shook my head. They just drop him? He's like a curse. You either find some way to drop him or shuffle him onto someone else. Otherwise, you'll look like you're on his side, and you don't want people thinking that, Harry. This is insane. He's a disgrace to the force, Murray said. He's a disgrace to what we stand for as police. But wasn't he only seven years old when the crime occurred? I got a six-year-old, Murray snapped. She knows it's wrong to kill people. Hell, my three-year-old knows that. I'm too busy for this shit, Harry. I got a couple of missing yachties from Queensland on my desk. I'm looking at hundreds of pictures of identical boats all day long. I'm seeing boats in my fucking sleep. What are you doing with a Queensland case? Oh, he sighed. The wind seemed to go out of him suddenly. Long story. It's bad. It's just one of those ones that gives you the creeps. Tell me about it, I said. I hoped by listening kindly to his problems for a few minutes, he'd take his fury down a few notches. It seemed to work. When he spoke again, his voice was softer. A retired couple in their fifties was last seen on their yacht heading south out of Brisbane. They travel a lot, so the woman does her own kidney dialysis on the boat. She's got some kidney problem. I don't know what. But she hasn't filled her prescription for the dialysate, the stuff she rinses her kidney with. By the family's calculation, the couple should have dropped into Sydney a couple of days ago at the latest to fill the prescription. If they did drop in, they didn't sign into the marina, and they haven't filled the prescription. Nobody on the East Coast has seen them. They were selling the boat. It's possible they swung in and picked up potential buyers, but we don't know. Jesus, I said, as sympathetically as I could. Sounds complex. Why haven't I seen it getting much press? It's early days yet, and these yachties go missing all the time. Decide to change direction on a whim and don't know their comms aren't working. Everybody's hoping they'll just pop up again in Indonesia or something. I don't know. I got a bad feeling about it. The Coast Guard is on the lookout. Anything I can do? No, Harry. There's nothing you can do. His tone sharpened again, as though he'd realized I was only listening because I wanted his help. Look, Murray, I want to understand what I'm dealing with here, I pleaded. What exactly is Tox supposed to have done? How many people were involved? I want to know exactly what he was charged with. I've got to find out what kind of man he is. I don't know, Harry, but I'm disgusted that you're even interested, Murray said. We're supposed to be the good guys. He's an insult to us, and so are you right now. The phone clicked dead in my ear. Chapter 26 The blaring of a horn woke me. When I looked out my bedroom window, Tox Barnes was sitting in the driver's seat of his black 69 Mustang, revving the engine. When I got in the car, he tossed his phone into my lap. Check it out, zombie face he said. Zombie face. He flipped the mirror down in front of me. He was right. I looked decidedly undead. I rubbed my eyes and raked back my apparently homosexual hair, slapping the mirror away. On the phone screen was a video on pause. I clicked play, and the car was filled with the sound of deep-throated groaning and grunting. Ugh! I threw the phone back at him with barely a glimpse of the bare thrusting ass on the screen. You're disgusting. I'm not sharing my porn with you. That's our victim, Claudia Burrows. I took the phone back and watched. The camera panned around the ass and up the thighs of a petite blonde woman. I'd seen that mouth before, with Tox Barnes's finger in it. Where'd you find this? I was trying to figure out how she got those tits, he said, pulling away from the curb. Her bank account showed she'd never been able to afford them. Then I got to thinking, adult film producers will sometimes pay for larger hooters for their actresses if they agree to appear in a certain number of movies. The films sell better if the girls have got a 
said a big juicy. All right, all right, all right. She appears in that video as Claudia D. He pointed with his cigarette. Had an old porn addict I know dig it up for me. It's about a month old, straight to DVD, not available online. Nice work. Maybe that's where the big payoff was coming from, he said, roaring through the traffic like a lunatic, weaving in and out of the oncoming cars. Maybe there was a feature film coming up. Yeah, and maybe she pulled out of the big film, I said, and someone decided they weren't going to be messed with like that. I've met plenty of these porn guys. Women are just like horses to them. When they break down or they go wild, you take them out the back and put a bullet in their brains. Chapter 27 Diabolic Videos had a studio on the upper floor of a building on bustling George Street, up a flight of carpeted stairs that reeked of gasoline. A huge pink neon sign at the top of the stairs blinded me as I arrived at the tiny foyer where a girl with too many piercings sat texting. What is that smell? I covered my mouth and nose with my T-shirt. Some girl's ex-boyfriend came in here last week. <sighs> Looking for her, the Pierce girl yawned. Poured gasoline all down the stairs. Said he was going to light the place on fire if she didn't come out. She come out? Tox asked. The place on fire? We're looking for people who know this girl here. I showed her a picture of Claudia, her parents had provided us with. Piercings hardly glanced at it. She only had eyes for Tox. You don't look like no cop. What do I look like? I don't know. The girl leaned on the counter, wriggled her booty. But I like it. This girl. Here, I slapped the photo on the counter. Okay, okay, jeez. She pushed aside a curtain and led us through. The space was divided into quarters by painted black partitions. I could hear whips cracking in the farthest corner. We passed an empty bed and arrived in the middle of a film set. Two huge black cameras were manned by men. On a satin-sheeted bed, an unnaturally hairless woman was propped, the hem of a blazing white tennis skirt flipped back over her thighs. Her cotton polo shirt was ripped across the middle and tied tight beneath enormous breasts. She twirled a blonde pigtail in one hand and licked the handle of a tennis racket she held in the other. Tox pointed. What is she going to do with that racket? Excuse me. A man with a clipboard stepped out of the glow of the lights. You're in the middle of a live shoot here. I'm Detective Blue. This is Detective Dirty Creep. We're looking for someone who is close to Claudia Burroughs. I flashed the picture. We know she did a film here a couple of months ago. We want to speak to anyone who has any knowledge about her murder. I've never seen that girl before. The producer turned his nose up at the picture. If she's dead, it's her own fault. Someone tapped me on the shoulder, and I turned around, only to be yanked face first into yet another pair of breasts. The girl hugging me was wearing six-inch silver sparkle heels and nothing else. Harry! she squealed. Oh, my God! You little doll! What are you doing here? I'd handled Vicky Varuma's sexual assault claim at Surrey Hills a couple of years earlier. Vicky, I smiled up at her. Hi, tell me you know this girl. Oh, man. Vicky's face fell as she took in the picture. Now there's a piece of bad news. Chapter 28 She was talking about everything changing. Vicky said. She was out of here. She asked me for some money so she could get set up and said she'd pay me back when she came into her big win. What was the money for? I asked. We were sitting in the diabolic video's dressing room. I'd caught sight of myself in the mirror and realized Vicky's hug had covered my face and neck in body glitter. It was proving difficult to wipe off. Tox stood nearby, examining bottles of perfume. I don't know, 
but I saw her near Potts Point wearing some pretty flashy clothes. I was driving by, and she was with another girl. Maybe she had a job or something. Who was the other girl? I don't know that either. They were shopping for handbags on Maclea Street. Damn, girl must have hit something good. Why did you say out there that Claudia was bad news? Tox asked. Oh, Vicky looked embarrassed, turned to the mirrors and started braiding her hair. I feel bad now. She's dead. You shouldn't speak ill of the dead. You should if it'll help us. She was just a slimy character, our Claudia, Vicky sighed. The kind of girls who end up in this industry aren't usually your silver spoon types. But I'd met Claudia's parents, and they seemed like nice, quiet people. Regular people. I couldn't figure out how she ended up the way she was. So deceptive. She always had a scam on the go. Like what? Oh, like she'd tell you she knew where to get cheap ecstasy or something, you know, for the weekend. She'd take your money and come back crying, telling you the dealer had robbed her, smacked her around. She'd show you bruises that were non-existent or days old. That sort of thing. Right. She lied like you wouldn't believe. <laughs> so she made a good actress for Diabolic. I think her parents thought she was a waitress or something. But she lied about things that didn't matter. She exaggerated and exaggerated until you were basically being asked to believe she had this crazy, wild, extravagant life. She was dating movie stars and international spies. How sad, I said. She was always on the verge of a new life. The big money she was supposed to be coming into. I don't know, Vicky shrugged. Sounds like bullshit to me. I think she'd applied to the university. She was going to buy an apartment, transfer up into a law school program, be a criminal lawyer. She kept watching clips from legal dramas on her phone, practicing them out loud. I mean, please. Girl could barely read. How'd she get into school if she could barely read? I'd say she had a friend fill in the application form for her. She'd have paid them to pack it full of lies about how she was ready to knuckle down and study. Vicky looked at me. I can see why she was so determined to live a new life. The life she was living here <laughs> was a total fabrication. Chapter 29 Hope's plans had stalled. She knelt on the deck of her yacht sanding the scratches in the polished wood, trying to keep her fury contained. The scratches went all the way from the anchor mount to a door at the side of the vessel, from where she dragged the anchor she had tied Claudia to. In the first days, Hope had been sick whenever she'd thought about it. All that would go in time. Already she couldn't remember her face. Piece by piece, the memories would fall away. She just had to continue with the plan. Hope heard a shifting in the bathroom. She got up and marched there, slammed open the door. Finally, he was awake. Ken was just coming to his senses, shaking the chloroform fog from his head. He looked down at his sleeping wife, at the sheen of sweat on her skin. The woman was ghost white. So, I had a magnificent time at the bank, Hope snapped. You got the money? Ken's eyes widened. Now you can let us go. You can... Don't pretend you didn't try to send me into a fucking trap, Ken. Hope slammed the door again so that it banged against the shower frame. The joint signatures? You were hoping to trip me up and your plan failed. I wasn't, Ken panted, swallowed hard. Hope, look, I didn't try to betray you. I just want to get my wife to a hospital. I just want this to be over. Jenny has got hours, not days, until her kidneys are going to fail, and she's going to die. Do you understand that? Do you think I'm a fucking idiot? Hope sneered. No. Ken shook his head. No, of course not. You're very clever, 
It would take someone very clever to pull something like this off. I've planned every aspect of this thing, Hope said. Nothing is going to stop me. I deserve this. You understand? I've waited my whole life for my moment. You've got to make your own life, Ken. You've got to change your own destiny. Nobody's going to change it for you. Imagine if you staged an incredible plan like this without hurting anybody, Ken nodded along. Wow, you'd show everybody. You'd go down in the history books. Hope sighed. She'd been enjoying Ken's praise, but he'd taken it a step too far. The man must know what had happened to Claudia. Two young professional women had approached him about his boat. Those same two had accompanied him and his wife around the harbor, followed him down into the engine cavity to inspect the boat's inner workings. Now that their real purpose had been revealed, one of those girls was gone. Even from the bathroom where she'd locked them, Ken and Jenny must have heard Claudia's scream as Hope had brought the hammer down on the back of her skull. The scrape of the anchor. She felt exhausted as Ken launched into his tired pleas again. It won't take long. All you have to do is bring the machine in here, Ken said. There might be enough dialysate left for one more dose. Just untie one of my hands and I'll— You're going to die, Ken, Hope said suddenly. The man before her stiffened, his eyes wide. Hope shook her head, bored, as she continued. You're both going to die. You might as well just accept that now. Chapter 30 Tox and I settled in a bar on the strip in King's Cross, sitting at the open window watching the pimps and prostitutes wander up and down in the light rain. It seemed appropriate to head into Sydney's red light district. What we'd learned of Claudia's life made me gravitate here where the liars, cheats, and criminals came to play. The homeless crowding into corners to escape the wind, and the hopeless slouching around the bars, tired from weeks of endlessly drinking away reality. King's Cross was also just around the corner from my apartment. I hoped to wander back after a quick drink and get some much-needed sleep. My phone calls and emails were ceasing to have any effect, as word spread throughout the police force that I was working with Tox. When I called to see if the full autopsy on Claudia's body had come in, an officer at my station put me on hold for half an hour and then hung up. I only got the report by calling back and pretending to be someone else. I couldn't get hold of the secondary detectives I'd tasked to look after the Burroughses, so I called their lawyer and asked if everyone was okay. I stared at Tox while I waited on the phone, trying to decide how the man himself ever got anything done without fabricating multiple identities and ringing around the world every time he wanted anything. While I watched, I found myself trying to imagine him as a small child in a wild pack of other kids, pulling and grabbing and yanking an adult mother to the ground, stabbing her in a hurried rush, blood soaking their tiny clothes. I imagined him cornering her son, a boy his age maybe, holding the knife to the kid's throat. Why had they done it? Tox had a mean look to him, particularly with the bruised nose and double black eyes, the leather jacket that reeked of smoke. But I knew there was no killer look. I'd known baby-faced preteen boys in school blazers and caps who'd assaulted girls so viciously they'd broken their victim's spirits for life. Maybe it was all just a rumor, and Tox was innocent. But if it was, why didn't he do anything to change the black mark against his name? I was just starting to imagine him as a kind and gentle man wrapped in the shell of a dangerous one when he put his whiskey glass down, got up, and strode across the room with violent intent. I watched him take a pool cue from the rack, snap it over his knee, and roll the heavy end in his fist like a batter coming to the plate. All right, buddy, he said. Let's go. His target was a heavier, taller man who'd been playing a game of pool by the back doors of the bar. The heavy man in tox 
lunged at each other. Chapter 31 I was up and across the bar before I'd really taken stock of the situation. My sheer bewilderment at the fight and my own fatigue had me diving into danger without a plan. I ran over and grabbed at Tox, but one of the heavy man's mates pulled me off him and threw me into the edge of the pool table. That hurt. My fists came up immediately, and I gave the guy a couple of warning punches to the jaw. But that only made him matter. He swung a heavy fist at my head. I ducked, surged up with an uppercut that crunched teeth and bone and knocked him out on his feet. Before he could fall forward onto me, I shoved him back. He fell into a table full of glasses where two old men were seated. They hardly moved. The room was suddenly full of people. I felt a hand on the back of my head, grabbed and twisted it, heard a man scream. I kicked his knee out and he flopped to the floor. I looked up just in time to see another fist swinging at me. It glanced off my brow. I ducked too late and shot the guy with a sucker punch to the gut that folded him in half. Tox was holding his own against the guy he'd targeted originally. It looked as though it was all about to be over when five uniformed officers burst into the room, one of them leading a huge German shepherd on a leash. On the ground! On the ground! I flattened against the stinking carpet. The dog was standing right over me, barking in my face, slobbering in my hair. I realized I'd left my police-issue phone on the counter by the window when I'd run in to assist in the fight. As I lay being cuffed, I saw a homeless man shuffle along to the window, pick up the phone, and continue shuffling. We were dragged to a police van, which had been parked hastily on the street outside the pub. It was really raining now. Tox and I were shoved into the back of the van while the other fighters were herded up against the wall of the pub for a lecture about public brawls. The lead patrol officer stood in the doorway and wrestled the keys into the lock on the van door. We're cops, I said. We're both cops. We know, he replied, and slammed the door. Chapter 32 We sat in silence for a long time while the King's Cross patrol cops drove us out of the city. Tox seemed genuinely unconcerned with our situation. He leaned back against the wall of the vehicle, watching me calmly as I worked through several levels of blinding rage. What the hell brought that on? I asked eventually. We were in the academy together. Think he left the force a few years ago. He spotted me when we walked in, started giving me the stink eye. I thought he probably wanted a fight, so, you know, he shrugged. My life is becoming more difficult by the minute because of you, I snapped. I can't even get people to answer the phone anymore. Now you've pulled this shit, and I've lost my phone altogether. Meh, they'll issue you a new one, he rasped. Maybe, I shrugged, maybe they'll just ignore me. I'm hard to work with. Tox shifted, his cuffs clunking on the metal bench. You must have guessed that. Well, I didn't know it'd be this bad. No one's forcing you to continue. Are you kidding? I shook my head. I'm supposed to drop the case completely because you're a murderer? This was my case to begin with, asshole. You need to calm down, he said. You're going all pink. I tried to hold my tongue, but I was mad. And when I'm mad, the words tumble out. If I get mad enough, I start swinging. I was already imagining giving him a bop on that nose just to remind him how inconvenient he was. Did you do it? I blurted, shifting to the edge of my seat. Did you kill that mother and child? He looked up and held my gaze. Yes, he answered. Chapter 33 Why? I asked. Tox just looked at me. I wasn't going to get an answer that easy. I shifted against the wall and sighed, 
let the rumble of the van rock me back into tired numbness. We seemed to be driving for an hour. I got up and tried to look through the slats in the door and figure out where we were. Where are they taking us? I wondered. Not the King's Cross Police Station, Tox said. Of course not the King's Cross Police Station. I sneered at him, fell into whining. God, I should be in bed asleep now. I should have had a nice hot shower. I should have my lovely soft pajamas on. Pajamas? Tox snorted. The van stopped. I looked out the slats but could only see darkness, the occasional orange light. Two officers came around the back of the van and opened the door. Get out. I can't get down there with my hands cuffed behind my back. Get out. I noted the names on their badges, Demper and Loris, and then gave up and let them have what they wanted, the humiliation they thought would make them feel like heroes. I made a jump for the ground, landed badly, and fell on my face. It sounded as if Tox didn't fare much better. I heard him slump onto his backside, try to slide off the edge and stumble. One of the cops dragged me up. I'd bitten my lip. My mouth was full of blood. I sat on the ground as instructed, next to my partner. I was just getting an idea of where we were, some sort of industrial area near a canal when blinding torchlight flashed in my face. Obviously, you have no idea who this is. The cop flicked the light from my face to Tox's. My vision was clouded with green explosions. It's Tox Barnes, I said. I'm well aware. Well, clearly you need an information session on who you're working with here, because you couldn't possibly know who he is, or you wouldn't be hanging out in bars with him. No one with any self-respect would, the cop carried on. I sighed. Tox was squinting into the torchlight with one eye open. The light flicked between us, blinding us over and over. Tox bonds and a few of his friends beat a woman and a young son to death. I know, I know. Aren't you in sex crimes? The second cop jabbed me in the shoulder with his boot, causing me to topple over. How could you dismiss the gang rape and vicious beating of an innocent? I looked at Tox, thinking he'd jump in and correct an accusation as outlandish as this. He hardly seemed to be listening. Gang rape, too, now? I struggled upright and squinted at the cop before me. I felt strangely defiant on Tox's behalf. I can't keep up with all the versions of this story. What's next, cannibalism? She's on his side, one of them sneered. I can't believe it. Where's your badge? What? Where's your fucking badge, bitch? I was shoved to the ground. The cop took my wallet from my back pocket and tore out the detective's badge. They took my cuffs off my belt and my gun, too. Tox they left alone. He watched, passive, from the dark beside me. You're an embarrassment to the foss, the cop said, giving me a good kick in the ribs. He uncuffed me roughly and shoved my head into the dirt. Have some dignity and leave this vicious dog alone. They left us there in the dark, miles from the road. Chapter 34 Ken Spelling wasn't going to die. Not at the very moment he and his wife were beginning to settle into their well-deserved retirement. He was not going to die at the hands of some psychopathic freak who wanted to trade out of her shitty life the easy way. Convincing her not to chloroform him had been easy. He'd simply not responded when she called from the doorway, having feigned a sluggish fever from around midnight. When he was sure Hope had left the vessel, he went to work. Ken kicked off his shoes and wriggled out of his socks. He stood in the middle of the tiny bathroom cubicle and stared down at his sleeping wife, trying to think of a plan. Jenny was sleeping for longer and longer periods now, and when she was awake, she didn't make sense. Her words slurred and delirious, her eyes unable to settle. Ken needed to act now, before it was too late. He took a deep breath. All right? The door. That was a dead end. 
Though the bulkhead had wheels on either side, he'd heard Hope looping a rope through her side of the door every time she'd left them, probably tying it off against a pipe to lock them in. He experimented, turning his back to the door and shoving the wheel sideways with his bound hands. The wheel turned an inch or so and then clunked into place. Ken went to the wall beside the shower and kicked, listening to the sound ripple up through the iron hull. Yes, maybe he could signal someone by kicking. He lay on his back and kicked madly. Jenny barely stirred. In ten minutes he was drenched in sweat. He stopped and listened. There was not a sound from outside the vessel. He panted and stared at the ceiling of his prison. Maybe if he kicked in a rhythm, three fast, loud kicks, three slow ones, and three quick again. S.O.S. There had to be dozens of yachties wandering back and forth along the piers outside. Surely one of them would hear the signal. But how long would Hope be gone? How long could he wait for his signal to be heard? Ken wasn't even sure all this racket was making it through the double hull of the boat to the outside world. He stood again and looked at the porthole high on the wall behind the toilet. It had a single eye screw holding it shut. There was no way he could get it open with his hands tied. Or could he? Ken looked around the tiny room and spied the mop standing against the shelves of toiletries. I'm not going to die, he thought. I refuse to. Chapter 35 My major break came at midnight, but I ignored it. I was trudging up the stairs to my apartment block, scratching dried glitter and blood off my neck and trying to remember which key unlocked my front door. I'd lost my phone, but upstairs in my apartment, I could hear the sound of my laptop jangling with a phone call. The ringing was finished by the time I reached the apartment. I ignored it and fell face down onto the couch. I'd walked away from Tox in the dark of the industrial area without saying anything about the trouble he'd gotten us into. In truth, I was more horrified by his admission in the back of the van than I was by the roughhousing those idiot patrol cops had given us. It had taken fifteen minutes to find my wallet in the dark, up against the side of one of the warehouses where the officer had thrown it, and an hour to walk back to a major road. I'd stood there waiting for a cab for another half an hour, then had slept all the way home in it. The laptop jangled again. I didn't know how long I'd been out. I crawled to the screen and tapped. What? Harry? Vicky? Yep. I was telling someone here what happened to Claudia and I might have a lead for you, she said. I fumbled blindly in the dark across the cluttered coffee table for a pen. One of the other girls said Claudia had been hanging around a prostitute from the cross named Hope. Huh? I laughed. My instincts about King's Cross and its connection to this case were right. The cross was where dreams, lives, and promises failed. Claudia had been cooking up some kind of dream, and it had gotten her drowned at the bottom of the ocean. Hope, I said. That's all you got? That's all I got. I'll take it. Thanks. Almost immediately, an instant chat message popped up on the screen from my brother, wondering why I hadn't been answering my phone all night. I gave him a brief rundown of my experience out in the sticks, my fingers dancing over the keys. Sam Blue, Designer, 77. Are you okay? Should you go to a hospital? Blue, Harry. I'm fine. It was just a roughhousing. No worse than the guys used to give each other at the academy. Sam Blue, Designer, 77. You should report those cops. Not only is it assault, but if they didn't arrest you, Dragging you out there against your will was probably abduction, right? Blue Harry. You don't rat on your colleagues in this business, Sam, no matter what they do. We deal with our problems in-house. Sam Blue, Designer 77. God, it's all so pathetic. Blue Harry. Speaking of abductions, how'd the second interview on the George's River Killer thing go? What did they ask you? I watched the screen for an indication that Sam was writing back to me. 
He started, and then mysteriously the speech bubble he was writing in disappeared. I waited for whatever was distracting him to go away, but he didn't start typing again. I had a strange urge to call him. My sisterly senses were in overdrive, but I told myself it was just fatigue. Chapter 36 Tox didn't have any kind of desk. No police station would officially lay claim to him, so he would wander from station to station, picking up cases as he liked. I'd heard his old department over in Auburn had started processing a transfer to North Sydney for him, and then the paperwork had stalled. They'd been waiting for the police officer in the transfer position in North Sydney to transfer out, apparently, and then he hadn't. They'd filled Tox's spot in Auburn, so he existed in administrative limbo, not really Auburn's problem, not really North Sydney's. He might have complained and had the whole thing cleared up, but I got the sense that the wandering life suited him. He was basically a freelance detective, a consultant, but without the extra pay consulting detectives receive. Sometimes he would nab cases from the police scanner radio that he kept in his car. That's how he'd gotten onto Claudia's crime scene before me. He'd been out driving and had heard about the find. When I arrived at Surrey Hills Station, he was perched on the corner of one of the coffee room tables, tapping away at that old, broken laptop. A group of my colleagues glared at the back of his head. I wondered if he'd gone home at all. He was still wearing the bloodied shirt. He didn't see me come in. Chris Murray was scrolling through pictures of boats. His computer screen was littered with CCTV footage of yachts. He looked at me guiltily as I went right to Pop's office and threw open the door. I need a gun, a badge, some handcuffs, and a phone, I said. Pops glanced up. Detective Nigel Spader, whom I hadn't noticed sitting in the chair behind the door, burst out laughing. Oh, yeah, I said, slumping into the chair next to him. It's really funny when police issue items go missing. It's hilarious. Laugh it up. How did this happen? Pops asked. How do you think? I'm radioactive from spending too much time with Tox Barnes. I'm practically glowing. Cops are coming out of the woodwork to mess with me. Oh, Pops asked. Which cops? I sighed. Pops knew I'd never snitch. No one's forcing you to stay with him, Nigel shrugged. Just drop him. He'll solve it himself. There's a new sexual assault on the case board this morning. Tell him you've got to prioritize that. I closed my eyes and reveled in a private fantasy in which I thumped Nigel's head back into the wall behind him. Maybe I should just drop him, I said. Maybe I'll give the sexual assault to one of the probationary detectives and jump over onto the George's River Task Force. Oh, wait, I forgot. I don't have a penis. Nigel sighed. Did you seriously shut me out of that case because I'm a woman? I asked. Or do you actually have a reasonable motive? Like, do you have a suspect? Why don't you think you can trust me with your suspect? Both men were quiet. Again, I felt that strange tingling up the back of my neck that told me something was very wrong here. That there was something very important being hidden from me. But one look at Nigel's face convinced me it was just him and his team being misogynistic assholes. He looked like one. Soon, I would know how wrong I was. Chapter 37 It took five minutes just to get the mop across the room, shuffling the thing with his knees and feet, knocking it against the walls, the shower cubicle, his sleeping wife. An hour to get the handle through the screw loop over and over, turning the screw just a quarter inch at a time. He sat triumphantly in the middle of the tiny room, exhausted, looking at the porthole propped open with the mop, the glorious blue sky outside. His face had swollen with pressure around the duct tape gag, sweat pouring down his neck. He tried to rouse Jenny. If he could get her to wake, try to slip her smaller gag off by rubbing her face against the frame of the shower, shout for help out the porthole. She woke briefly, blinked at him with uncomprehending bloodshot eyes. No, 
was up to Ken to save them both. The big man stood, steeled himself, and climbed up onto the toilet seat. He looked outside and saw no one. Never mind. There might be people only yards away out of view. He got down and kicked the second shelf of the cupboard down. Jenny's bathroom products scattered everywhere. Perfume bottles shattered. Shampoo and moisturizer and toner, all manner of women's things. Ken grabbed a shampoo bottle awkwardly by the neck between his big and second toes and hopped over to the toilet, almost losing his balance and falling by the shower. He climbed up and with an agonizing stretch of groin and hip and thigh muscles he didn't know he still possessed, he leaned against the shower, raised one leg, and slid the shampoo bottle through the porthole. He heard the gentle splash, looked outside and saw no one. Ken hopped down, shuffled to the pile of toiletries, and grabbed another bottle with his toes. He had to work as fast as he could. He wanted a steady stream of floating debris, more than the usual marina junk. Someone would spot his breadcrumb trail. Someone would rescue them before Hope got back from wherever she was. It was their only chance of survival. Chapter 38 it took some serious cage rattling through the strip clubs, bars, and brothels of King's Cross to hunt down information on Hope. I heard fragments of her tale from homeless girls lounging in the back doorways of the supermarkets and kebab shops there. She was whispered about by conspiratorial old men in the upper rooms of pussycats, showgirls, and porkies, where the rubber stairs glowed all day long with neon lights. A crow-like old madam on Ward Avenue, with a split lip, told us her full name, Hope Stallwood, and where she'd been staying. But like most working girls, Hope moved around a lot. She pissed off her roommates with her drinking and drugs and her loud, late-night entrances. She was always broke, downtrodden, sullen, tired. I'd known plenty of girls like Hope in my time on the sex crime squad. Mostly, they ended up dead in a bed somewhere, and I was brought in to assess whether they'd been taken advantage of before they expired. They all looked the same after a while. Bruised thighs, tangled in the dirty sheets. Tox and I didn't talk about the night before, but I'd stopped viewing our relationship with any kind of hope that it might be extended a minute longer than it had to be. When this case was over, I was getting the hell away from him. It wasn't the ill treatment I was suffering from my colleagues that disturbed me. It was the calm and gentle way in which he'd said, Yes, when I'd asked him if he was a killer. I replayed it in my mind over and over whenever I looked at him. Yes. 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 It hadn't seemed possible that a man who'd done what he was supposed to have done as a child could be so normal. Well, normal-ish, I realized that I hadn't really believed he'd done it at the start. I felt shaken now that I could be so wrong about someone. I followed behind him, lost in my thoughts, as we moved from bar to bar and brothel to brothel. Everyone we spoke to about Hope Stallwood told us she was coming into money. Just like Claudia, she'd been on the verge of having it all. I wondered if that meant we'd find her dead. Chapter 39 When Hope got to Pier 14, she spotted two men standing by the edge looking into the water below them. Something about their fixed stare made her blood run cold. She walked by quickly and hazarded a glance at the gentle waves below, where a shampoo bottle and four other bottles floated. Where's it all coming from? one of the men was saying. Hope looked and saw he had a wet deodorant can in one hand and a bottle of styling mousse in the other. Let's go have a wander around, the taller man said. See if we can see who's dumping rubbish. Oh, my God, Hope gushed, setting down her bag. I'm so stupid. Those are mine. The two men turned and stared at her. She took the bottles from the shorter man and shoved them into her bag. I was cleaning out my bathroom this afternoon. I must have left the tub of products on the edge of my boat. 
Oh, this is so embarrassing. It must have fallen in. There's stuff everywhere, the tall man said, his face softening. A couple of bottles floated over there near Pier 16. I saw a toothbrush, the shorter man laughed. God, Hope sighed dramatically and pushed her hair back. God damn it. I'll clean it all up, I swear. This is so embarrassing. She hustled away toward the new Hope, glancing back to see the men laughing and muttering to themselves. Hope's eyes were burning in her skull. If she didn't need Ken so badly right now, his end might have come much sooner and bloodier than she'd planned. Chapter 40 An old Indian woman answered the door to Hope's apartment. She was even shorter than me and peered out angrily from the crack in the door. When she saw Tox, she started to close it again. My boot was in the way. We're looking for Hope Stallwood. What do you want? The drugs? The woman howled. The drugs, they ruin all of you. She's not here. That whore. She took her drugs and she's gone. Tox shoved the door open, almost knocking the woman over. We found ourselves in a tiny, filthy kitchen, my boots stuck to the linoleum. I'll call the police. We're the police, I said. Sit down. Tell us where Hope went. You're the pimps. Pimps with the drugs. Rotten drug dealers. I'll call the police. A young couple had appeared in the doorway to a short hall. I walked past them into a labyrinth of tight rooms divided into smaller rooms by hanging sheets. There were mattresses on the floor everywhere, aluminum foil on the windows. Everything reeked of cigarette smoke and curry powder. A baby cried somewhere. I stepped on someone's foot and apologized. The owner of the foot was sleeping and hardly noticed. I didn't know how people lived like this. Prisons were better. There was black mold on the bathroom ceiling that could have been an inch thick. My mind was rushing with crimes as I looked around the ground. Possession of heroin, possession of marijuana, child endangerment, child neglect, rental fraud, underage drinking. Tox pushed aside a pair of damp towels and found a filthy bare mattress in the corner beneath a window. Hope Stallwood was here, he asked the young couple who'd started following us around the apartment like wary dogs. They nodded. Hope was long gone, but she'd left a couple of things behind. A plastic container of hair ties, some underpants and clothes that reeked of body odor, a few old, stiff pairs of shoes. I picked up a magazine and let it fall open. Yachting today. There were yachts circled in the for-sale section of the magazine, the pages indented with scrawled red pen. What's this? I showed Tox the circled boats. Was Hope lying here at night under the lamplight, circling boats she dreamed of owning? Was it all fantasy, or was she actually making plans? I held the paper close to my nose. She'd actually underlined some of the phone numbers for making inquiries. There were digits listed on the back page. I flipped forward a few pages and found a page was torn from the magazine. I ran my fingers along the ragged seam. Tox and I realized what we were seeing at almost exactly the same moment. Goosebumps raced along my arms. We could call the magazine. He took out his phone. Confirm which boat is missing from the mag. No, I said. I know which boat it is. Chapter 41 this time, she'd chosen the branch at Martin Place. The streets were flush with lawyers on their lunch hour, gliding around in their slick suits. As their cab drove through the traffic toward their stop, Hope kept the gun pressed against the inside of the handbag in her lap, the barrel pointed right at Ken. She had to keep the fury in her heart contained now. This was the most important part of her plan. The man beside her sat crumpled against the side of the cab. She might have broken a couple of ribs when she came at him with the hammer after his stunt with the toiletries. She didn't care. He deserved it. He looked pathetic sitting there, his eyes wandering over the people in the street. 
She could see on his face the desire to open the door and grab one of them, inform them that he was a hostage. His mouth fell open as the cab came to a stop at a set of traffic lights right beside a police cruiser. Hope jiggled the handbag, reminding him of his situation. Try anything, anything at all, and I'll be right back on that boat with your wife before you can utter a sound, Hope murmured, glancing at the cabbie's face in the rearview mirror. I'll shoot you, and before the police can work out where you've been, Jenny will be dead. I'm not going to try anything, Ken whispered. You can take the money, take everything, just... Hold up your end of the deal and leave Jenny on the pier unharmed. We'll see if your performance is convincing enough, Hope said. I'm not making any promises. They walked to the manager's counter arm in arm. She shot him the loving look of a happy wife, slid her hand down and gripped his rough, warm hand. What a lovely creature he was. She almost didn't want him to die. The manager this time was an older, portly Asian man in a nicely tailored gray suit. He wore a small pink flower in his lapel and stuck his hand out for a shake a good ten feet away from Ken. Sir, madam, how can I help you today? They explained their business. The manager wore genuine regret on his face that they would no longer be customers, but brightened again when they spoke of their plans to travel the Greek islands. He waved them into a small private office as though he were welcoming them inside his own home. So, he eased into his chair and turned the computer monitor toward himself. The nameplate on his desk read, Bai Yim. What's the approximate amount of your holdings here, Mr. Spelling? Eight hundred thousand, Hope answered for him. She felt a pulse of electricity run through her phony husband's body. Yes, Hope had seen their accounts. She just hadn't been able to access them. He must have been surprised at how far her planning went. He had no idea. So, I imagine you'd like the amount in a direct transfer check? No, we'd like cash. You're not concerned about carrying that amount of money overseas? International piracy is a real threat, you know. Oh, no, we've taken provisions, Hope smiled. And we've got customs approval to take the amount out of Australia in cash, foregoing the $10,000 limit. Ken glanced at her. She was prepared. Of course I'm fucking prepared, Hope thought. This is my one shot. I'm not going back to that life. I'm never, never going back. She pushed aside the flurry of images that swirled through her at the thought. Sweat-stained beds and needles, the crush and roar of the crowd on the strip, the hollering and laughing of men in the hallways. Money in, money out. Money in, money out. I'll get our guard to escort you to your car, then, Yim said. You can never be too careful. They all laughed. Hope put Jenny and Ken Spelling's IDs on the table. Mr. Yim hardly glanced at the cards. His eyes were on the computer screen as he tapped their names and numbers into the keyboard. His expression changed in an instant. Chapter 42 Mr. Yim rubbed his nose, glanced at Hope and Ken, and painted on a crooked smile. Everything seems to be in order. He rose unevenly from his chair. I'll just, um... Hope grabbed the computer monitor and swung it toward her. The screen was blinking with a bright red warning sign. She'd seen it reflected in the shiny buttons on the front of Yim's shirt, the light making the mother-of-pearl surfaces flash pink. New South Wales State Police Alert. There was a phone number, a brief message. Hope stood and whipped the gun out of her handbag. Yim threw his hands up. Did you press the button? I... Did you press the fucking button? She actioned the pistol. Yim shook his head, but there was no telling if he was lying. She hadn't seen his hand move while he was sitting, 
but he could easily have nudged the silent alarm under the table with his knee. She'd seen him shift awkwardly in the chair before rising. Time to initiate Plan B. She turned and shot Ken twice in the stomach. The man bucked violently at the impact, then doubled over. He didn't make a sound. Nor did the gun, thanks to the silencer. Hope shifted her aim to Yim, and the old man whimpered. Chapter 43 Hope walked stiffly toward the entrance, the gun tucked beneath her flowing silk shirt. The glass doors of the bank were only yards away, still opening and closing as people walked in and out. The silent alarm had not been tripped, or the doors would have slammed shut immediately, the bulletproof screens at the crowded counters flying up to the ceiling. It was too late now to hope of getting the spelling savings. She'd have to settle for the yacht. If she could get into international waters before the police figured out where she was, she'd be fine. There would always be other couples to scam. Right now, she was in flight mode. All that mattered was getting away. She walked across the bank foyer to the doors. Hope didn't count on Ken's blood having run so quickly from his wounds in Yim's office. As Hope walked toward freedom, her stolen high heels left a series of red triangles in her wake on the huge white marble tiles. Hope looked up just as the teller at the end of the row noticed them, her frown deepening as she tried to work out how the customer could have walked in red paint inside the bank. The two women's eyes met just as Hope reached the door. Excuse me, miss, the teller called. Miss! Hope turned and ran. She fitted through the glass doors as they snapped shut just at the last second, the edges catching her shirt, tearing the soft fabric. The crowd parted as she waved the gun in the air. Get out of the way! Move! There was a taxi on the corner. Perfect timing. Hope was going to make it through this. She was going to see that sunrise on the ocean. No one was going to stop her. Chapter 44 On the way back to the station, stopped at the traffic lights at Elizabeth Street, three patrol cars zipped through the red signal in front of us, sirens blaring. An ambulance was hot on their tail. They were heading toward Martin Place at an incredible speed. I'd been trying to get Chris Murray on the phone, but he wouldn't answer. Finally, I took Tox's phone and dialed, hoping Murray wouldn't recognize the number. Chris Murray. Murray, you asshole, I said. You've been ignoring my calls. I don't have time for your calls, he snapped back. We yelled into the phone at the same time. I found the yachties! We were both panting with excitement, struggling through the confusion. What? Chris said. I've found the m missing couple, I stammered. Well, I, I know... Who knows where they are? I'm tailing a suspect, a prostitute named Hope Stallwood, in my drowning case. I think Hope and my victim, Claudia Burrows, were working together to steal your couple's boat. Claudia ended up as excess baggage, maybe got dumped when the scam was over. Probably your yachties, too. Well, I'm hoping you're wrong about that, Murray said because a young Caucasian female has just tried to access the couple's bank account in Martin Place, and they tell me that whoever she is, she wasn't alone. Jesus Christ, that must be her! I'm on my way right now, Murray said. I'll see you there. I grabbed Tox just as we set off across the lights. Turn the car around, I told him. Head back toward Martin Place. Chapter 45 We ran across the crowded square and pushed through the ring of people at the police tape around the bank. The alarms inside were still squealing, but the big glass doors were open and cops were running in and out. One passed me with his hands covered in blood, rubbing them on the front of his shirt, looking dazed. I knew hope was on the edge. Anyone who had lived for long enough in the kind of environment she had was probably pretty close to manic-depressive. I spend so much of my job hoping I'm wrong, 
I hoped, as I pushed through the crowd, that somehow I'd made a mistake while joining the dots. Connecting the yachting magazine to the missing couple who had disappeared at sea. Maybe I was jumping to conclusions, leaping down a rabbit hole that would take me nowhere. I hoped I'd walk into the bank manager's office and find the missing couple there safe. I wasn't so lucky. There was a man in his fifties on his back on the marble floor, bleeding to death in a huddle of paramedics. He'd been shot or stabbed, it looked like. The situation was so desperate that the paramedics had foregone getting him to the hospital and were trying to stem the bleeding right there, in front of everyone. There were female bank tellers in snappy red suits crying in each other's arms. I grabbed one and yanked her away from the tearful huddle. Who is he? I don't know. She wiped her running mascara. He, he came in with her. The shooter. They were a couple. Mr. Yim saw them in the office. We didn't hear the gunshots. They walked in together, and then she walked out. Someone saw blood and went in and found them. I turned the corner and glanced into Yim's office. He was slumped against the back wall, his face gray, a bullet hole in his neck. Two men were holding a dark jacket against his wounds, but it was clearly over. I heard the man on the ground struggling against the paramedics assisting him. She's still on board, he cried, taking gasps of breath. She's got her. She's got my wife. Chapter 46 Hope leaned against the bridge wall and kept the gun on Jenny, watched out the windows as the other yachties lounged and talked on their own vessels. Soon the cops would swarm the piers looking for her, a black and poisonous cloud rolling out over the water, stifling the afternoon sun. She'd be long gone before they arrived. Jenny was not in good shape. She clung to the helm shakily, her head nodding gently as waves of exhaustion rolled through her. Hope told Jenny to fire the engines and guided her on the throttle. The older woman's hands were so slick with sweat she could hardly grip the wheel. I'm sorry it has to be this way, Hope said. This is probably going to be awful for your family. Where is Ken? Jenny whimpered. Put on port five, Hope waved at the helm. Bring the throttle back a bit. I have two grown sons, Jenny said. They have children. I don't care. Just tell me if Ken is still alive, Jenny pleaded. Tell me what happened. I, I have to know. Hope hardly heard the sick woman at the helm. For many years, Hope had been thinking about people in terms of how they related to her circle of care. A wide ring around her shut people out or welcomed them in. It encompassed the people who were her responsibility, those she could trust, those it was safe to love. The circle had shrunk a little when she was a child, every time her father had beaten her, so that the man had slipped out of it completely over time. When he'd grown old and mild, always moaning about forgiveness and mistakes, Hope hadn't been able to bring herself to pull the man back inside the circle. For a while, in her teenage years, there had been friends and boyfriends inside the circle, but they'd walked out steadily as she'd taken to drinking and partying. When she'd started working in the cross, she'd looped that small but loving circle around the other girls in her brothel. Together, they'd gotten through the long nights and sleepy days, pulled each other up from the depths when it all became too much, watched out for the telltale track marks that meant someone was losing control. But when Hope had been kicked out of the brothel for hiding profits from her madam, she'd found herself and Claudia the only two people left in the circle, and Hope was so used to people walking out or being squeezed out that she had really just been waiting all the time for Claudia's turn to leave. And that turn had come when she'd fulfilled her role in taking down the spellings. Hope had had no use for her after that. She wasn't part of the glorious plan. The circle was closed. Strangers like Jenny didn't have a chance. Hope directed the older woman to rev the engines when the bow was pointing to clear, empty horizon. Behind them, Hope could see cops arriving on the pier, 
they'd stopped the taxi driver before he could get out of the marina. It was a close call, but Hope was getting ahead of them. Maybe she'd make it. There were plenty of heavy things on board to tie Jenny to if she got in trouble. Chapter 47 I picked a vessel close to the end of the pier and shuffled the old couple who were having tea on the back deck off it. The water police in Sydney Harbor were gearing up, and the Coast Guard was sending a chopper. The radio I'd taken from a patrol cop at the bank was roaring with dozens of voices coordinating things here and there. A hostage negotiator teaching young criminologists at the University of Sydney was being pulled out of a lecture and driven at top speed toward the coast. I stopped Tox on the back deck. Maybe you should stay, I said. What? He scoffed. Fuck off. Look, I said, this is our case. We don't want it fucked up by idiot water police guys who insist on ignoring us because you're on board. If you're not around, I've got a chance of having some pull out there. I want control of the situation. I'm not leaving this case. Tox pushed me away. Get on the helm and shut up. They're going to fuck with us out there and lose us our suspect, I said. Tox, you're a murderer. I'm a killer, not a murderer, he shouted. There's a difference, Detective Blue. I stared at him. He was ignoring me. He worked the helm like an expert, bringing the boat out of its mooring and turning it toward the sea in a seamless glide while its owners railed at us from the pier. I didn't know what to say. He glanced at me. I don't care that people don't like me, he said. I deserve some punishment. But I don't drop cases, and I don't lose suspects. I opened my mouth to answer, but nothing came out. He gestured to the throttle. Get moving. He looked to the horizon. We've got to catch up and talk her down before she does something stupid and kills the hostage. The police radio channels separated. I got onto a channel with the water police and Chris Murray. The Coast Guard hung back and let us take charge. Three boats behind a row of five police cruisers and toxes in my commandeered leisure yacht. We lost sight of land quickly. The freshly painted New Hope grew larger as we inched closer. It was an hour of slow, restless following before Hope finally answered repeated pleas to talk over the radio. She came through loud and clear on the channel reserved for the police. I've got Jenny Spelling tied to a compressor, she said. She's going overboard if you get any closer. Chapter 48 The command team, led by Chris Murray, said nothing about Hope's progress out to sea. As long as she was talking, Murray seemed happy to let her trundle on ahead of us. But I wanted Hope to stop. While she was underway, she thought she was shifting closer and closer to being free, and I knew negotiations would last longer while she felt she had the upper hand. Jenny Spelling was sick. She wouldn't last a twelve-hour siege. I shifted in beside Tox at the helm and pointed to the new Hope. Come up alongside her, I said. Keep your distance, like she said. Don't get any closer. I went out of the bridge and down the steps to the back of our vessel. There was a tarp to protect the deck from the rain, hanging over the rear of the galley. I tore that down. I dragged a net out of a box on the deck and then went inside, grabbed sheets and blankets from the bed, and lugged them out onto the deck. Hope's vessel slowly loomed up beside me. All the lights were on. I could see the young woman standing at the helm, looking out. I couldn't make out her expression. Jenny was on the other side of her, just her feet visible near a gap in the wall outside the bridge. I don't know what this boat is doing out to my starboard side, Hope's voice was high with tension on the radio, but I want them to fuck off. What are you doing? Tox shouted at me. Go round the front. The engines roared beneath me. I copped a hit of sea spray in the face as the boat lurched over the waves. As we came across Hope's bow, I waited until the right moment and then began hurling the sheets, blankets, tarp, and net into the sea. What the fuck? Hope screamed on the radio. 
I hung on as we took a huge wave to the starboard side, crossing over to Hope's port side. I didn't know if my plan had worked immediately. There was no discernible crunch of the propellers as they became tangled in the debris I'd put right in Hope's path. After a while, I noticed her boat was slowing. There was smoke on the wind. I looked up in time to see Hope on the port side standing over Jenny as she lay helpless on the deck. As I watched, Hope looked back toward the boats behind her and raised the radio to her mouth. You shouldn't have done that, Hope said. Now I'll have to punish her. Chapter 49 Hope unscrewed the silencer and threw it over the side. The gunshot cracked over the ocean, rolling and echoing on the waves. Jenny didn't move. Hope's voice was impossibly high on the radio, the screech of a deranged woman. You do not want to fuck with me right now, Hope said. This woman is really sick. It won't take more than a couple of shots to finish her off. Fucking psychopath, I seethed. Hope turned and popped off five shots at us. One clanged off the roof of the boat, mere inches from Tox's head. I threw myself to the deck and listened. Tox veered the boat away. Good move with the tarps, Tox said as I crawled back into the bridge. Detective Blue, that was a damn senseless move, Chris Murray blasted on the radio. He wanted the water police to hear that he didn't agree with the risk I'd just taken in case it caused Hope to kill her hostage. He also wanted Hope to know she had a good cop to trust now that it was clear who the bad one was. I switched over to the Coast Guard channel to talk back to him privately. She won't kill her, I said. Not yet. Your actions have caused the hostage injury, Chris snapped. Jenny Spelling didn't move an inch when that gun fired, I said. I reckon Hope's bluffing probably put a hole in the deck. She can't risk the only leverage she's got. Chris switched back to Hope's channel. Hope Stallwood, this is Detective Christopher Murray. The detective who disabled your engines acted completely without authority. Hope's voice came over the radio. Detective, your people are going to get an innocent woman killed! Is that what you want? Now you're going to have to provide me with another vessel. If you don't start listening to me, I'm going to kill her, okay? I'm going to murder her right in front of you! She was almost screaming. Murray needed to bring her tension levels down before she did anything stupid. I'd raise them to manic level, but it had been worth the risk. The water police and Coast Guard vessels were slowly maneuvering around the front of the New Hope, trying to box her in while she was distracted. Hope, we're going to need you to tell us what condition Mrs. Spelling is in, Murray said. We can't see what's going on. Did you wound her just now? There was silence for a long time. Hope was focused on her victim. She wandered down the bridge a little, turned, and paced back. Her face was taut. Jenny's legs were moving. I could see her knees jostling through the gap in the bridge wall. There's something wrong with her. Hope's voice crackled on the radio, frighteningly calm. She's having some kind of... seizure. Chapter 50 What exactly is wrong with her? Tox asked. Murray said she's got some kind of kidney thing, I said. I don't think she's had her medication. That's how the family knew something was up, why they reported the missing. My whole body ached to be on that boat. Though she wasn't giving us any details, I knew Hope could have wounded Jenny with that gunshot just to mess with us. The shot could have tipped Jenny over the edge into a seizure. Hope walked to the end of the upper level of the boat and looked at the vessels ringing her, paced back again, and stared at her victim, now still. Hope, are you willing to let us send a medic on board? Murray said. Hope went to the end of the boat again, lifted her gun, and started firing. I ducked, but she wasn't firing at us this time. Murray's boat had been carried forward a little farther than the others as we came to a stop behind the New Hope and she was warning him back. 
I saw all three officers on board dive for the deck. Girl's gonna run out of bullets in a minute, Tox grunted. He was right. Hope stopped firing and returned to the bridge. When she reappeared, she had a hunting rifle in her hand. She pointed it skyward and fired at the Coast Guard chopper, which was hovering high above us. She only gave it one shot. This was probably her last gun. Move back, her voice screeched on the radio. Murray put his boat in reverse and came into line with the rest of us. Every second of growing darkness was agonizing. Jenny wasn't moving. A couple of times, rogue officers on the water police boats tried to creep forward into the circle we'd established around the New Hope, but she spotted them soon enough and forced them back. I could see the air compressor she'd tied Jenny to. A third of the heavy, squat machine was hanging off the edge of the boat, just beyond the gap in the bridge wall. When she felt threatened, Hope would go to the machine and rattle it, push it farther over the edge, and then pull it back. I waited for Jenny to move. She didn't. I couldn't take it any longer. All of the